Okay, Mr. Marshall, it is 6.30. You are a co-host for this meeting. We are recording and the attendees have come on in. So whenever you're ready. All right. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of April 6th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.32 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then place yourselves back on mute. Maria Chow. Present. Uh, Jack Jemsek. Present. Tom Long. Present. Uh, we believe Andrew McDougall is going to arrive late. So uh, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman. Here. Thank you. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment can also be heard at other times during the meeting when determined appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation will be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so uh, I, it looks to me like we have a fairly full agenda for this evening. Uh, so uh, we have two hearings and um, several other items to, to discuss that may take some time. So I'll hope I'll try to keep things moving uh, along quickly and board members, please try to make your comments uh, this evening, especially succinct. Uh, you don't need to say everything, you know, in slightly different ways a couple of times. All right, so tonight we have, uh, as the first item on the agenda uh, is approval of minutes. Uh, these will be the March 16th minutes from our last meeting. Um, and uh, they were drafted by Chris and included in our packet. Uh, Johanna, I see your hand. I move to approve the minutes. All right, thank you, Johanna. Does anybody want to second that? I'll second. All right, thank you, Janet. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. Do you wanna describe anything about the minutes? I just wanted to recognize Pam because Pam was really the oh. one who prepared the minutes and I just edited them. So thank you, Pam. And thank you both. Um, so do we have any board members who wanna make comments or changes to the minutes? 
from March 16th. Johanna. It just struck me still as quite long and quite detailed and a little bit he said, she said. So um, thank you, Pam, for doing it. But um, you know, I, I don't think it needs to be quite so detailed. Those are my comments. All right. So you're not asking for any question for any changes on this set of minutes, but suggesting future guidance. Okay. Uh, I don't see any other comments. So uh, why don't we go ahead? We have a, a motion. We have a second. No more comments. Uh, why don't we go through a, a vote on approving the minutes? Uh, Maria, we'll start with you. Approve. And Jack. Approve. Uh, Tom. Approve. Uh, Janet. Approve. And Johanna. Approve. And I'm an approve as well. So that's six votes in favor. Uh, Andrew's absent, and we've we don't have any other minutes as far as I know. All right. Uh, the second item on the agenda is our public comment period. As I stated at the beginning, these this will be for public comments that uh, concerns topics uh, that are not on our agenda for this evening. I see eight attendees in the attendees. Uh, screen. Uh, do any of those folks want to make a public comment on something not on our agenda? All right, uh, I'm not seeing any raised hands. So we will move on to item three on the agenda. Uh, the time now is 6.38. And this was on the agenda as published for 635. So we're, we're not uh, starting before it was advertised. So this is uh, a public hearing. And let's see, in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 41, Section 81, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SUB 2022-07, John Robleski concerning 446 and 462 Main Street. Request approval for a three lot definitive subdivision plan, center east way under Mass General Law chapter 41, sections 81 L, O, R, T, U, and V, including one street with a total length of 100.89 feet to the center of a cul-de-sac. Map 14B, parcel 66 and 68 in the BN zoning district. Do we have any board member disclosures? I don't see anything. And it looks like Tom Reedy has entered the participant panel and John Robleski. Um, and I also see that Nate has arrived, Nate Malloy. So uh, Tom and John, uh, do you wanna make our, your presentation? Sure. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst, here on behalf of Center East LLC and 462 Main LLC uh, in, in Mr. Robleski and his application for a definitive uh, subdivision plan approval for the sites that the chairman mentioned. Um, with me this evening, you, you all know and, and remember John Robleski, uh, ultimately site owner here and, and certainly site manager. So by way of a bit of background, we had filed a, a preliminary subdivision plan, which you, know, you probably all remember. Uh, we made a presentation. We had a pretty lengthy discussion about the purpose of that preliminary plan filing, um, frankly, to, to freeze the zoning. Um, it was approved, uh, as I think you'll see in Ms. Brestrup's, um, I think it was in her development application report. It, it, it frankly doesn't matter if it was approved or not. It's really the, the timing of it, but it was approved because John put money into getting it to a place that it could be approved. And then this definitive plan was really born out of that preliminary plan. And so, We've, we've, as the chairman noted, uh, proposed a three lot definitive subdivision plan with 
a roadway and cul-de-sac. Um, it's essentially what you saw before. We have asked for several waivers. Um, and I should back up and say, we don't expect approval this evening. We will be in front of the Board of Health. I think it's April 21st uh, for a hearing in front of them. And I know that um, the board would like, and I think it makes sense for uh, us to get feedback from the Board of Health and really to explain to them the process that we're going through and the purpose that we're doing this for. Um, so we don't expect a, an approval this evening. Hopefully we can make our presentation and talk a, a bit about the waivers, uh, see if there are some that, that you would grant as conditions, others that we would likely be able to comply with um, as they've been drafted by Ms. Brestrup. And then continue this to your next meeting uh, in May. And then I, I know there's a time period for you to make, you know, take final action, make a decision. Um, I'd say, let's see how far we get tonight and, and come back, the, the, you know, and I'll, I'll defer to Ms. Brestrup because she's probably going to be the one who has to write the decision and can tell me in May whether or not that's doable um, to get it filed in time. If it seems like it's not, then you know, I'm sure Mr. Robleski can be reasonable and we can grant an extension to, to get to something where we're not talking about constructive approval because that's not the, the purpose here. So that's just a little bit of kind of overarching background. The intent is still not to build this. It is strictly for a zone freeze. And so our, our thought is that the, ap the application we submitted with the waiver requests we've submitted and the timing of those waiver requests, meaning if in fact, John were ever to construct this, those items that we had now asked for waivers from would need to be complied with. You know, if it was ever, if, if he ever sought a building permit under this definitive subdivision plan, we would expect to have to comply with those things that we asked for waivers from. So just so you know, we're not trying to skirt around anything. It just makes sense for Mr. Robleski, I think sense for the town not to frankly waste more time than they already have with all due respect, because this is this is the process that we have to go through. So again, just some context. And then, you know, with that, if, if you'd like, I can share my screen and, and walk you through the project. It's going to be very similar to what you what you'd seen before. All right. Thanks, Tom. Sure. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I was just uh, why is the Board of Health involved? State law. I, I believe it's part of the regulations for how this process works. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think it's typically in the context of like septic systems, uh, overburdening of land, but it's it's functionally required, statutorily required um, that we have to go through the Board of Health and they have to opine. Okay, but there's no septic systems here. Correct. No, 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 no. But yeah. it's it's part of the uh, process that we have to go through under Mass General Laws. The, the Board of okay. Health is a, a party to this. Okay. Thanks. Sure. All right. Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'll I'll be relatively brief. Understanding that we will be back here again, and this is the same thing that you saw, uh, you know, a few months ago. So you've got you know cover page property owner. Subdivider applicant prepared by the Berkshire Design Group and Randy Eiser over at Harold L. Eaton and Associates had performed the survey. You've got an index plan. You know, you've got a key plan showing. I think everybody's familiar with the site. And, and if any point, Mr. Chairman, maybe after our presentation, you want to talk about the site visit. You know, you can certainly talk about the site visit, um, the index plan showing a little bit blown out where we are. This is just an existing conditions survey. Uh, you've got uh, Gray Street here, Main Street here in a, a east to west direction. You've got the two parcels. This is that building that was uh, approved and has been built and is fully occupied. Um, this building was in fact removed. If you've been by the site, it's, it's um, I don't know if it's a graveled area at this point. And you, there's a little um, maintenance trash shed here. And then you've got the existing building at 446 Main Street. So this is existing conditions to the west is Gray Street, to the south Main Street. Uh, and you've got the railway on the southeast. And then you've got um, 
additional multifamily housing on the right, and then some private residences to the north. So just to orient you, it's in the BN zoning district. I think the only BN zoning district in the town. Uh, here is the proposal. So you've got um, one access. You've got a 77-foot-wide um, throat opens up into a cul-de-sac, uh, full circulation around the cul-de-sac. You've got a sidewalk on the westerly side of it. We are proposing three lots. Um, we've got a 100-foot building circle showing that they could be residential and in, in nature. Um, so you could fit a, a residential dwelling unit within the within the building circle, uh, stormwater easements um, called out. And then we've got uh, grading and planting plan. So here you'll see the topography, um, 100 feet over here, it, it slopes down to the southeast, 98, 97 feet, and so on. You've got some street trees planted around the cul-de-sac. You've got some landscaping inside the cul-de-sac. Again, still the, the three units. Utility plan, showing the water coming in off the street with stubs, stubs, and here's the water main, transformer pad, water shut off. You've got uh, existing uh, sewer manhole. So there's a, a sewer line that connects here on the easterly side of the property. And you also have a PVC sanitary sewer, which connects to Gray Street on the, the westerly side of the property. Uh, there's an underground detention basin um, that currently exists at the site and, and ostensibly it would be used for the, the future development conditions. Then we've just got some specs, some bituminous concrete paving, what the specs are, uh, the walkway, the curbing, the tree planting, um, your catch basin, stormwater treatment, outlet control structures, sanitary manhole structures, uh, your detention basin, what that's going to look like, your subsurface infiltration system, maintenance uh, port, um, and then you've got your inlet and, and outlet details. So some, some details um, that the, the town engineer would likely be more interested in. We haven't got any feedback from him, but I think he also knows uh, what we're looking to do here. So not to breeze through it so quickly, but effectively that's what we're proposing and you know, obviously, you know, the, the town has pretty robust and usual rules and regulations um, relative to the subdivision of land. And so we had asked for some waivers for certain things. Um, and, and I don't know if, if we want to talk about those at, at this point or if we want to you know, continue to, if, if we want to talk to, about Ms. Breaststrup's proposed conditions. You know, well, I think for. Uh, I, th I think if you've completed your presentation, we'd like to go to the, the site visit report and yeah, uh, sure. that would Please. be the next item on our usual order of things. Okay. So uh, are you finished? Yeah, I, we can always, I can always answer questions and I can keep the screen up or I can stop sharing if you want to see everybody, you tell me. Uh, well, why don't you stop for a moment? Okay, easy enough. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, we did have two site visits yesterday. Um, I think uh, Janet and I were at the at this property, and then John, Janet and Johanna and I were at the second property for our second hearing. Um, Janet, do you want to do the site visit report? You're muted. Yeah. I'm sorry, I could, I could, I would love you to chime in. I feel like I've visited this property at least four times so far. So I'm not sure um, if I can offer anything new. Uh, the only thing, the new thing I noticed was the, um, that there was a, a roadway from the one parking lot to the other. Um, and one of the really lovely old buildings was taken down. And um, I mean, the lot is pretty much just as described. It does slope down, um, you know, it's, you know, there's obviously a brand new building on it. Um, with I think 24 units or more, I can't remember quite. Um, you know, it's, I, I mean, do you have anything to offer? It's, you know, it's, it's next to a railway line. I can't remember if there's a sidewalk in front. I was trying to remember that earlier. 
Is, is there a there sidewalk? Is, there is a sidewalk on Main Street. Uh, yeah. I don't think there's a sidewalk on the Gray Street frontage. Yeah, I think just on, on Main Street. Yeah. And um, there's definitely ample parking for everybody because there's now two combined parking lots. And the building that, the older building that's there um, has several um, offices there. And I think one person who lives there too. And so, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a nice site, you know, the building, it's an attractive building that was built. The building that's there is still very attractive. I can't remember anything about locations of trees. Do you remember anything, Doug? Uh, I didn't uh, focus on the trees. You know, that was the first time I'd been on the site since the house was demolished. And uh, as you mentioned, the connection between the two parking lots uh, had been constructed. Um, you know, I'd been there before. I'd been there several times. Uh, I think in the conversation with uh, Mr. Robleski, we discussed the fact that this is sort of a hypothetical process we're going through. Uh, mm -hmm. with the ultimate aim of uh, um, freezing the zoning prior to the passage of the latest mixed use building uh, zoning. And, um, but we Chris pointed out that we have to take it seriously. This is a, um, you know, sort of the price of paying the zone, of freezing the zoning is to go through this process. Um, and uh, so, I think that that's something that I'm going to want to keep in mind as we're talking about waivers. Um, so anyway, I don't have anything else to say about the uh, site visit report. OK, so Janet, if you don't have anything else, no, uh, we'll no, go I don't. on. And um, the next uh, usual topic uh, is questions from the board. Um, I think uh, Tom or Chris, one of you, it might be good to just go through each of the waivers that's being requested um, so that we kind of get those fixed in our minds as we have the conversation. And uh, Tom, I'm not sure we really need the visuals for that because it's most of your waivers are not concerning the actual design, it's, concern, it's, con, it's concerning the process we're going through and the requirements of the process. Yeah, and I mean, if Ms. Brestrup wants, I can pull up, uh, she had circulated our application and part of the application was the waiver letter. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to bring that up if we wanna go through that. I think Chris might have a, a few extra from her development application report that she can just interject so we can, we can talk about those. Sure. Why don't you bring that up? Um, actually, before we go, go ahead and bring it up. But before you do any reading from it, I see two hands. Jack? Yeah, I just uh, wonder if we get a rundown of the pre versus post kind of development um, factors here, you know, with regard to impervious cover buildings, etc. Just got, trying to get a handle on that. All right, um, that would be on maybe the second of your drawings. Is that right? Yeah, let me. So Jack, I don't know if this is what you're looking for. You know, underneath you could see um, what exists, you know, the former building location, the existing building, it says, it says to be removed, but that's just assuming this plan went into ex existence. Same thing with here. So you can see what you've got. Um, I don't think we show parking area. Like, so we don't have like a total developable area and, and what it would turn into in this plan. Um, but you can certainly see where the, the building, the existing building locations are in relation to the lots. But but in your in your mind, it's it's roughly, you know, similar to the pre-development in terms of uh are you talking about lot coverage? coverage? Yeah. Well in terms of per in purple and, and uh you know pavement and, and building area. I mean is it oh yeah I mean if we so again we're walking down a hypothetical if if we were to build this three lot subdivision 
there would likely be less pavement than existing. My my less coverage, I'll say, than existing. My guess. Okay. All right. I just trying to get a, a feel for that. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Chris, I'm going to call on you next. Did you want to comment on that exchange? Yes, I just wanted to note that we really don't have any plans for these three lots, and that's typical of a subdivision plan. The subdivision is all about the roadway and the division of the parcel into lots, and it's not necessarily about what's going to go on each lot unless you also have a site plan review that goes along with the subdivision, which would be true of a cluster subdivision. But for this type of subdivision, we wouldn't necessarily know anything about what would go on in any of these lots, but each one would come before the planning board for approval, um, unless it were a residential subdivision. And if um, single family homes were going to be built here, that wouldn't be necessary. But this has been characterized as a non-residential subdivision. So I would assume that buildings that would be built here would be mixed use or office or something like that rather than single family homes. But anyway, those things would be approved later on after the subdivision was approved. Thank you, Chris. But uh, since you touched on it, um, what is it in the documents we received that would make us know that this was not a residential subdivision? Where is that indicated? In Mr. Um, I think it's Mr. Chamberlain's um, uh, development impact report, development impact statement. Um, I think there's a mention in there. It's okay. non-residential or somewhat somewhere in the paperwork that was submitted. There's a statement that this is a, a non-residential subdivision. I'm not, it doesn't jump out at me right now, but maybe Mr. Um, maybe Mr. Reedy could point us in the direction of where it says that. Tom, you have any? I'm ideas? looking myself. <laughs> so. it, could, it could be that it was in the, oh, here it is, yes. Page one of um, Mr. Chamberlain, Berkshire Design Group's um, development oh, yeah. statement, the second line down, type of project, non-residential subdivision. Okay. And I think just to put a finer point on it for the, for the sake of clarity and maybe argument, um, simply because it has been designated here as a non-residential subdivision, I don't think that would preclude the applicant in the future from developing it as a residential subdivision, provided that they met with they met the zoning requirements um, in the zoning district for single family, two family, et cetera, so. Okay. So that distinction doesn't have any practical impact at this point. Only in so far as I, I think in your um, rules and regulations, there's a couple of places that, that mention non-residential. And I think that's because the state law requires a preliminary plan to have been filed for non-residential because typically with non-residential, they want to give the planning board an opportunity to review it versus residential where you can, there's no requirement in a residential subdivision to submit a preliminary plan. You can go straight to definitive. Preliminaries, besides the purpose for what we're using it for, but like preliminary plans are used to give, uh, have a discussion inform, said formally, but informally with the planning board before the developer goes and spends real money in designing a definitive plan, which is much more costly than a preliminary plan. So there is a distinction in your rules and regulations as far as timing goes and in state law as far as timing goes, but uh, there's no other import to it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Janet. Well, I have a question about like context and process. So um, Mr. Oblaski is asking for waivers of requirements in our rules and regs for subdivision um, subdivision plans. And um, then, you know, and then also um, in Christine Brestrup's um, draft conditions, there's a lot of references to, you know, we'll get more information on this or get more, you know, prior to the endorsement of the definitive subdivision plan by the planning board. So, I was just kind of a little bit lost between those two things. Like, is Mr. Reedy asking for an absolute waiver of you know these 20 conditions? Or, and then is Ms. Estrup recommending that we don't have to address them now, but when it comes time for the definitive subdivision plan and we have to approve that, then we can have a we can get much more detail that we normally would get earlier. And well, well, Janet, this this is this definitive subdivision plan discussion. 
Yeah, but so, when, so the, when the later is probably when, you know, in the event that they actually want to build this subdivision, when well, they come for site plan review. So I think there's some time limit where we have to have an endorsement of the definitive plan. So I just wanted to see if Chris could give me the context of it. Are we talking about waivers of conditions forever or okay. waivers so, till endorsement and just put us in time and space? All right, Chris. Um, so one thing is that um, the planning board can waive any requirement that's in the um, planning board rules and regulations. The planning board can't really waive state law, but um, your rules and regulations have a lot of specifics in them and you can waive any specifics that are in there that aren't also in the state law. So that's one thing. Um, the way the planning department is looking at this now is that, um, you know, Mr. Robleski is asking for uh, approval of this definitive subdivision plan. Um, and that is something that takes effort on the part of town staff and effort on the part of the planning board. And I think we all need to take this seriously. And in my mind, and I believe in the mind of the building commissioner, you know, we, we think that most of the items that are required by our subdivision rules and regulations should be provided. And our, the conditions that we've suggested um, would require those conditions to be satisfied or those requirements to be satisfied prior to the planning board actually signing a definitive subdivision plan. And whatever Mr. Uh, Rilbleski wants to do with the plan, whether he just wants to keep it on the shelf or whether he wants to record it, it needs to be endorsed by the planning board in order for it to have substance or weight or actually, you know, to exist. Um, the planning board can approve it, but if the planning board doesn't then endorse it, then the, board, then the uh, subdivision plan doesn't really exist. The way the law is written, the planning board has 90 days from the time that something is submitted until the planning board needs to act. So that's the period that we're in right now. But the rules are undefined with regard to how long does the um, planning board or the applicant have to bring back the documents for endorsement. And the, I'm getting into the weeds a little bit, but essentially, according to our town attorney, what this means is that some um, applicants, you know, put off uh, bringing their plans back for endorsement for years. And then um, they are allowed to say that the uh, eight years of their zoning freeze starts on the day of the endorsement. So they get like, you know, a few years ahead of time before they bring the plans back for endorsement. And then they get eight years beyond that for a zoning freeze. So we're trying to not allow that to happen. We're trying to be, you know, pretty careful and pretty deliberate about what we're doing. We're, um, we're suggesting that some of the waivers that are requested by um, the applicant and Mr. Reedy may, may make sense but many of them we feel um, should be complied with. And, and, that, and we can talk about that when we're going through the conditions. But um, you know, some of the things are not very expensive things. And there is a, an advantage going to the applicant to freeze the zoning for a period of eight years as a result of this process. So we think everybody needs to take this seriously and only grant waivers that are um, really necessary or realistic and, and that everybody agrees with. So why am I saying all of that? Janet asked the question about like what stage are we in now and what, what stage are we going to be in the future? The planning board can approve the plan, the definitive subdivision plan with conditions and you can talk about which ones you want to have. And then sometime in the next six months or a year, the planning board will be asked to endorse the plan, which means to sign it. And then Mr. Robleski will have a real plan that he can have either keep it or re record it at the registry. And that will be the implement by which his zoning gets frozen. So the stage we're at now is reviewing the plans, deciding how to condition it. Eventually you're gonna make a determination about whether you're going to approve it. And then you know we move into that second stage. Does that answer Ms. McGowan's question? 
Yes, I have a follow-up question. So, um, and this is jumping a little ahead, in the draft conditions, you suggested that we endorse within six months of our approval. So at that time, they would come back with all this much more detail and we'd be sort of revisiting these issues in more detail. Is that correct? May I answer that? Yes, Just yes. yes that's the idea. Um, and that period could be six months or it could be 12 months. That's a time period that was suggested by uh, Joel Bard, our town attorney from KP Law. Six or 12 months makes sense, but you have to put a time limit on it. Otherwise, as I said, the applicant, and we know that Mr. Robleski has all the best intentions and so does Mr. Reedy, but it is possible that they could take years to bring back their plan for endorsement. And so we wanna you know, put a time limit on so that we get this process done and move on to the next thing. Chris, can, can we compel them coming back with the material needed for endorsement? No, but if they want a plan that's endorsed, then they need to bring back the material that you require. Otherwise, and, they don't have- And do we have the option to not endorse it at that point? You do, yes. Do we have the option to not approve this definitive subdivision plan? You do have that option, yes. Okay. All right, uh, Janet, I hope that gets you partway to your questions. Uh, Jack. Good for now, thanks. Yeah, I'm just, uh, um, what's the status again? I, I, um, I might have missed this, you know, with regard, uh, with regard to the site visit review, but um, I know, you know, both buildings will be coming down at some point, but uh, what, what's the existing situation there? And do these buildings have any historic value? And would there be any, you know, consideration of, you know, moving them and 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 uh, reusing them, you know, within, within the Amherst area. Tom? Yeah, so there's that, um, and I think Ms. Bresser had her hand up, I might steal her thunder. If Chris, if you wanna go, I'm, I'm happy to relent. But uh, yeah, so there's, uh, there are two existing buildings on the site. Um, and I wanna, I guess I'll be clear in my answer. For the purposes of the sub of subdivision, I don't think any of this stuff matters. Uh, for the purposes of ultimate site development, we'll be back before you uh, probably in the relatively near term, next couple of months, in a totally separate process that's separate and distinct from the subdivision approval. I think for site plan approval for what Mr. Robleski is looking to do on that 446 Main Street site. Um, you know, the he's you'll see what the ultimate plan is. So it's, and I know this is tough to, to wrap your head around because, you know, we're talking about this being a fiction, which it is. And I also want to take a step back and say, you know, we respect the process by requesting these waivers. You know, we're saying, acknowledging what it is, but we also want to make sure, you know, we respect the board, the town, the process. So we don't want to try to say, oh, oh, don't worry about this. It's, it's not a real subdivision. So we don't have to do any of this stuff. So, you know, we're on board. I think what we talk through the waivers and ultimately, Ms. Brestrup's proposed conditions, we're fine with all of them. There's probably one that I want to talk about, but otherwise, you know, I don't, we don't see a problem in um, going through that process to get, you know, hydro CAD, stormwater calculations, subsurface soil info, like all of that stuff we can certainly do. So, you know, that's, that's all fine. Um, and so I know I'm not directly answering your question, Jack, but you'll, you'll see, um, in the coming months, what's going to be proposed there? I think the I think the board will be really pleased with what ultimately is going to be proposed there. So, a little bit separate and distinct from. All right, this. Tom. Thanks, um, Jack. I see your thumb, so uh, I guess you're all set. Chris, was there anything else you wanted to say since you had your hand up when Jack started or when Tom started responding? I think Tom sort of said what I would have said. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, so why don't why don't we go through the waivers and um, yeah. So as Ms. Brestrup noted, um, one of the things that I, I like about your rules and regulations, as many other towns have, you have the ability to waive uh, certain strict compliance 
uh, with some of those requirements. So what, what we've gone through here is you know, some filing requirements. So three overlay acetates de depicting flood prone, air flood, flood prone areas, aquifer recharge areas, soils, slopes greater than 25% in vegetation types. I know that in Ms. Breaststrup's development application report, I think she was waiting for uh, counsel from Jason Skeels on that. Um, so I don't know if we if, if we want to have more of a discussion about that or just to put a pin in it, find out what Mr. Skeels thinks is important, not important. And then if he thinks it's important, you know, it's, it'll probably be included in the next iteration. Um, if not, right. then, you know, hopefully the board would see their way to grant a waiver. All right, Tom, um, having kind of had you start this, I, I, I've got a question for Chris. Chris, would we be better off just going through your one of your documents, which include, you know, which lists these waivers, or should we be going through uh, what Tom was showing part of the application first? It's really hard to say. In fact, I think ultimately it would be better to bounce back and forth, but that would confuse everybody. So, um, okay. I, I guess it's good to go through Tom's list, and then we can go back and look at my list and see what we haven't touched yet. And what I said about the three acetate overlays was that I was going to ask the town engineer whether that was still required or not. Um, I doubt it because people don't use acetate overlays anymore. And um, the other thing that I thought is that um, at some point it should be shown um, on the plans what the soils are and what the vegetation types are. So that should be documented on the definitive subdivision plan somewhere. And right now it, it isn't. So that was my okay. answer to that one. All right. So maybe we try proceeding just as we did this one. Uh, Tom, why don't you describe what you're proposing? And then Chris, maybe you can let us know your thoughts on it. Great. Um, so the next one is the, the definitive plan contents. And so the scale that we've proposed is one inch equals 20 feet. Uh, required is one inch equals 40 feet. Um, I don't want to speak for Chris, but it seemed like she was fine with that. I was fine with that. Yep. Well, that's a larger scale. So I would think that would be a, allow more detail, which would be a positive change. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, for the datum, all elevations to refer to USC and GS benchmarks if within 500 feet of the subdivision. Um, I'd I want to think that was good. Um, town engineer on that to make sure that what you've shown on the plan meets that requirement. And I'm not um, enough schooled in survey to know that. Okay. So the next one is the seal and certificate number of the surveyor. Um, and we can get this if it's something I don't, I don't remember what Chris had said, but it's, it's not a big deal. I think it was just at the time of submission we had not we did not have it from randy he obviously signed the application so um you know he's on board and no funny business here so if, if that's a requirement i don't see an issue that, yeah okay mm -hmm. and then we start getting into those um where knowing that this wasn't going to be built from our perspective, not going through that exercise and expense. And so the first one is subsurface soil conditions on the track and test pit data. Um, I assume this is related to the use of a septic system. Well, so no septic, but for stormwater. So stormwater. you get curve numbers, you do hydro CAD analysis, and then you figure out what the stormwater does on site, you know, and not to, um, put the cart before the horse, but this was something that I, I think we're fine doing. John has all the test pit data. He's just going to have to have Berkshire design go through the time, et cetera, of doing a hydro cat analysis showing, you know, what the impervious surface of Center East Way does, uh, and then showing how, you know, we've come up with a stormwater solution for it. So, you know, again, um, we can we can certainly comply. So I don't want to say like we're withdrawing these technically, but we we get the sense that if they're not going to be granted, we're gonna we're gonna comply. All right, Chris, what was your comment on this? You just That's what I wanted Mr. Reedy to say exactly what he said. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, invert rim and in, in, of manholes. I think 
same thing. That's just another technical level of design showing like topographically where those manholes are going to be. But if, if you want us to really go through and design the site, then those will be certainly part of it. It seemed to me that those were done appropriately. There were rims and inverts on those manholes. It could be checked again, but I didn't have a problem with that. Okay, I'll check. Sanitary sewer though, lot three, there was a stub shown to service lot three, but there wasn't any information about that. And there wasn't an invert on the um, stub coming out of that manhole. Okay. And I also wondered, this is a detail, but should there be a Y connection for lot one? There's a, a connection that shows a, a, you know, a T connection, but I didn't know if that was appropriate. So that was just something that I wanted somebody to look at. Yeah. Um, so the next one is uh, gas utility is maybe coordinated with the gas company and uh, street lighting. I mean, I, the gas utility is probably a fair waiver to request, given that there's a, a gas moratorium. Um, and I think street lighting, what Ms. Brestrup has said, is that the, the planning board traditionally requires that there's a street light um, at, the, at the head of the way where, where, the, where the new road intersects mm -hmm. uh, the existing road. And that, that would be fine as a condition. And if you um, spoke with the town engineer and he gave us an email that said that's not necessary because there's enough ambient light, then I think the planning board would um, go along with that. Okay. Uh, drainage calculations, again, given the fact that, you know, we're not going to construct this, we thought why go through the exercise of the drainage calculations. But again, going back to the earlier comment that, you know, we'll design the site um, as if it were to be built, then We'll, we'll provide those drainage calculations. And we can get those to Jason so he can look at them and confirm that you know the, the water runs downhill and it doesn't leave the site faster um, or less quality than it does pre-development conditions. So that was 15. Um, and what I had suggested to, to try to find that middle ground for some of these was you know, prior to actually constructing the subdivision, we would provide these. I can appreciate how the board may not want those and wants to opine or approve a plan that doesn't have those. They'll, they'll be the last ones that I have here. I'm gonna make that request and I'll explain why. But for these, I think it makes complete sense for the board prior to approval um, to, to have that information or, or between approval and endorsement, which as Ms. Prestrup noted, endorsement's really the big thing here. Um, a survey tied to the mass coordinate survey monumentation. Um, this came from Berkshire. I think it's something that we just asked Jason about and see if he's okay with it. And, and may, not, I ask, then, may I interject here? If Mr. Reedy would contact Jason, it's been difficult for us. I have to be um, candid about this to get uh, comments from the town engineer um, and I think the reason is that he is aware that this is um, not going to be built, not proposed to be built. And so, you know, he's got a lot of other things on his mind. And um, for me to get response from him is challenging, but for Mr. Reedy to get response from him may be less challenging. We'll, we'll certainly reach out. And Chris, probably what I'll do before is make a list of those items that I need to check in with him on. Mm -hmm. And then I'll send it to you just to make sure I'm not missing something. And then I'll get in touch with them. Okay, good. Um, distance to nearest town, county, or state monument on an accepted way. Uh, again, just an additional something to talk to Jason about. If it's required, we'll provide it. Um, you know, in, in your mind's eye, a lot of times subdivisions are done on large tracts of land where they might have 50 feet of frontage. And so, you know, they go back into 600 acres. So we a little something different here. So just to consider that as we're requesting these. Uh, sketch plan showing potential development for any adjacent land owned by the applicant. I would suggest everything's developed around there. Um, so this probably is a fine waiver. Um, profiles of proposed streets and sewers. Again, that's something we didn't provide given our, our position on this, but it's something we can provide. 
same thing with cross section for roads. So those are some, those are a couple of things. So those won't be waiver requests. I thought those um, would be pretty easy to uh, manage. Yeah, precisely. Yes. And then um, maybe I'm going to skip performance guarantees and just go down because these next, a few of these, I'm going to just glob together and hopefully have a discussion about street lights. Same thing. If it, I guess we'll check with the town engineer. If he says you need one, we'll put one. If he thinks we're fine, then you know we'll ask for this waiver. Uh, performance guarantee is the first one I, I would like to talk about for a little bit. And so, as you know, um, so performance guarantee can come in many different forms, surety bond, uh, covenant saying that we're not gonna release any of these lots unless and until we've got the town engineer to come in and say, you have constructed in accordance with the plan. And so for here, because we're saying we're really not going to construct this, the suggestion is, I would say, prior to the receipt of a building permit. So all the other ones, as, as Ms. Brestrup noted, were prior to the receipt of the endorsed plan. So you have approval, six months we have to, or 12 months we have to do some work, endorsement, and then probably put it on a shelf and never do anything. However, in the, in the case that John says, you know what, the market's changed, I want to take down this build, you know, what have you, um, let's, let's build this. We would then say, if we are going to build it in earnest, that's when a performance guarantee should come into play. And so our request here would be, it's endorsed with a condition that prior to receipt of a building permit, we get a performance guarantee satisfactory to the town engineer and the town plan. And so at least at that point, John's not putting up a, a, decom a, a, a security or surety bond. He's not... Um, putting a covenant, because I, I could just see, as, as you can appreciate, what happens is if you put a contract for covenant on the property, you're encumbering the title to that property. And so then any um, mortgage holder is going to say, well, what's this about? Or any potential purchaser is going to say, what's this about? Here, because we're not actually building it, but it would be a condition if the subdivision ever was to be built, so the town is protected, um, we would just look for that timing with the performance guarantee. So, like I said, all the other ones, you know, we're okay spending the money and doing this one probably feels a little bit more appropriate immediately prior to or, or as a requirement of receiving the building permit. So that's one that I have, have a problem with because when we talked to um, Rob Moore and I talked to Joel Bard about this, and he said we really needed a performance guarantee of some sort before the planning board um, endorsed the plan. And um, I think my feeling was um, putting a covenant on the property for the, the three lots and the roadway um, would be a reasonable thing to do because it wouldn't require any transfer of money, any purchase of a bond or putting money aside in an escrow account or anything like that. So I would like to explore the possibility of um, requiring the covenant. Yeah, if we could talk to Joel, I mean, and I'm, I'm happy to explore it. And just in my mind, when I'm thinking, okay, John goes to refinance this property, you're going to have a title exam done. There's going to be a title exam that shows there are covenants which attach to the land. And then you're trying to explain to lenders what, it, what that actually means and how it doesn't actually have any impact on this, you know, million dollar building that, that John has just built, so to speak. So it's, it's, it's that. So maybe, Chris, if we could put a pin in that um, and, and you know, whether it's I trade some emails with Joel or we, I go through you, however you want to do it is fine. Mm -hmm. yep. um, because if we can find some middle ground, we're happy to do it. It's just on the one hand, John's either paying money to a surety company um, for this or he's got an encumbrance on his title in, in for something that's not going to be built. So either one of those. And if Rob can hold up a building permit because none of that doesn't exist, then it's never going to get built. So Rob wouldn't issue the building permit until sufficient performance guarantee did exist. So that, that's the way I was thinking about it, but I'm happy to explore. Okay. Not knowing anything about covenants, uh, is there, uh, would it be legitimate for you to place a covenant on this for some duration and then say, uh, you know, at the conclusion of the actual development of the property, uh, there's some mechanism to remove the covenant? 
that's not a bad idea, um, Mr. Chairman. And I think what I'd like to do is, is think about that a little more and just the, the timing of that and, and how Mr. Robleski is going to finance this second stage of development. Ass assuming that it works out, then I don't think we have an issue with that. I don't want to speak for John, but I don't think, you know, as long as is, if it works out sequentially, I, I think that's fine. So I think it's certainly worth exploring. Uh, Janet, do you want to say something? You are mute. There you go. So, so um, I think usually the performance bond is not just uh, is to make sure that, you know, is to protect the public for when the developer starts but doesn't finish or digs and puts some infrastructure in but doesn't sell the lots or, you know, you know in a recent case, you know, doesn't do the top coat of the, um, I guess we had covenants for that one, I can't remember, top coat of, you know, doesn't finish the project. And so I would be uncomfortable tying it to um, the building permits because um, if, you know, if somebody, I'm not saying Mr. Robleski, but just the developer kind of goes down, you know, goes bankrupt in the middle of the project, that's what the performance bond or the covenants are for, is to protect the public from a half-built project. So I would like to see the covenants or the performance bond, you know, which also could just be five years or, you know, we, you, you buy a performance bond for five years and then it will, you know, extinguish whenever, you know, the, the thing is built. Um, I don't want, I would be very uncomfortable tying it to the building permit. I think that will help give the guarantees that we are looking for normally. And if I could just to put a pin in that, and I think we probably have a solution, but what you mentioned was when somebody starts and doesn't finish, what I'm saying is prior to that stuff, like we cannot start, a developer could not start unless and until they had that guarantee in place. What I'm saying is just don't make that as a requirement of endorsement. So the, the sequence is, you know, approval, six months to, uh, to a year endorsement, and then some period of time, if ever, before construction starts. Construction could never start if that, during that between endorsement and construct, I'll put it here, and construction start, um, if we didn't do what we had to do. That's just for clarity, that all said, you know, let us explore and see if there's a way to smooth this over so we're not going through brain damage. Right, okay. Okay, um, John. Mr. Chair, do you mind, yeah. Mr. Robleski? Yeah, there you go. Yes, yes, John, yeah. I'm sorry, I, I see your hand. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure the board understands that, you know, I, I do want to develop these parcels and add more housing, um, which is going to include some affordable housing there. And I don't know where the six month thing came up as far as the actual endorsement. And Tom, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the zoning freeze doesn't take effect until it's endorsed or approved. No, you're, you're frozen. You're in this thing called the process freeze, John. So as long as from the time of the filing of the preliminary plan as young, as long as you're pursuing this, you're fine. Well, I thought at some point somebody said it had to be recorded before that zoning freeze took effect. But it's, it, you're in the process freeze once we, so you get eight years from the endorsement. So all of this is extra. So what Chris was saying by putting a timeline on it, she's saying unscrupulous developers get the approval, wait a couple of years, then get the endorsement. So from the preliminary plan to when they actually get the endorsement is two years, let's say. And then from the endorsement to when the zoning freeze expires is another eight. So they've gained themselves a period of 10 years, which is contrary to what the statute really is intending to do. Right. So I just I just want to have the board and myself on the same page here that, you know, I do intend to file a site plan review sooner than later. So I don't want that to be held up, I guess, is my point waiting for another six months or something like that. So that's what my All basic right. question is. Well, I think it's entirely, I mean, if you want to come back to us two weeks after we approve this definitive subdivision plan and ask for endorsement, you know, we're not gonna, we're not trying to delay you and saying that we're not gonna endorse it for six months. It's, it, it, we were discussing it more as a, an outer limit for the inter, for the period between approval and endorsement. So if you wanna accelerate that, uh, I don't think, I don't see why we would object. 
All right, I don't think there's any reason to accelerate it if I'm understanding Tom correctly that it doesn't really impact the site plan review because that's a separate process in itself. And the two can probably work together. So yeah, I think you're all, you're already, you've already frozen the zoning so we can review a project under the old zoning anytime. Um, okay. I think the endorsement is the thing that starts the eight year time clock. And that's the primary uh, implication of when we do that endorsement. Understood, thank you. So then um, two more, Mr. Chair, this section here, uh, I think it's gonna have a similar outcome. However, you deal with the performance guarantee is gonna be mimicked in this section. And then this last one is just, um, there's an inspection fee uh, that gets paid to the town. Um, I think it's almost $1,100. I, I may be off a little bit on, on my numbers there. And so we, this is one where we would say, prior to us actually constructing something, you know, we'll pay prior to getting the, the permit to construct something, but to have John put it up $1,100 when he's not gonna construct something, um, you know, probably there could be a better way to do it. So, so that's our request. Chris, I don't know what your sense right. is on this one. Thanks, Tom. Chris? That one makes sense to me. Um, and I actually didn't even have it in my list of things that I talked about in the development application report. So that would be, be a, a waiver that we would support. Okay. Okay, and All that's right. it. So thanks, thanks for going through those, Tom. And um, Chris, it sounds like uh, you and Tom have a, some conversation with Joel Bard and- um, Jason Skills. And Jason yeah. and, and the Board of Health, obviously. And mm -hmm. so uh, do you, Chris, have what you need from us this evening? Have you accomplished your goal of uh, introducing this project and uh, you know, starting to help us understand what the issues are. Yes, I think so. All right, board members, are there questions you wanna ask of, of uh, Mr. Robleski's team this evening? Uh, this will certainly be coming back. Um, Chris, I think in some of our communication earlier, you'd suggested May 4th, I think a month, for when this could be brought back. Is that right? I suggested May 4th because that would be after the Board of Health would meet on May, on April 21st. Your okay. next meeting is April 20th, so I wouldn't suggest um, continuing to April 20th. So May 4th is the correct date to continue in my mind. Okay. And Mr. Reedy, does that uh, time That's fine. seem adequate yeah. or not excessive? No, no, that's, I think that's fine. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, so um, I assume we need a motion to continue this hearing to May 4th. Uh, Johanna. Um, I'm happy to make that motion, but are we gonna have a chance to ask questions too? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Uh, then I'll, why don't you hold off and we'll continue with board questions. Go ahead. Okay. I'm just trying to remember what you said at the last meeting. And I'm sorry, I, I know I could probably go back in the minutes, but can you just, this seems like an awful lot of hassle to go through if you don't actually intend to build it. So can you just talk again about why it's so important to you to freeze the zoning? Yeah, uh, sure. So it's, um, I don't know the date. I don't know if it was, if it was, January of this year, I'm, I'm, I've forgotten, but the town had passed mixed use, mixed use zoning bylaw that modified what was required um, as far as um, what had to be dedicated in the floor space to commercial uses versus residential uses. And that, um, given what Mr. Robleski has found, given this location, that would be, you know, for downtown, probably makes a lot of sense given the, the amount of walking traffic that you have there and how businesses kind of beget businesses, if you will. This is right on the outskirts of the downtown, if you will, down the hill. And so having to having to um, be obligated to perform with the, I think the 30% is, would be detrimental to the project here and would probably, you know, would probably not provide additional housing or affordable housing as Mr. Robleski has said, that's that's the intent, as you'll see, and pick a number, you know, a month or so. So in order to 
keep the zoning as it was at the time prior to, that's why we're going through this. Thank you. So Tom, um, on that topic, am I correct that uh, the, the filing for this subdivision plan came after the town implemented the 10% uh, or whatever for affordable housing on all projects so that any, any new housing you propose under the previous zoning would in fact include that or meet that requirement. Correct. Yeah, we are we're subject to yes, that was in the zoning bylaw at the time we froze the zoning bylaw. Right. And you can't okay. So it's really just the mixed use just change that is frozen. Correct. Okay. All right, great. Uh Jack. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, second uh Johanna's motion. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, are there any more board, is there any more board discussion or questions for this evening? All right, going once. All right, so uh, we have a motion and we have a second. Do we wanna open it up to the public? Oh, thank you, Tom. Sure. All right, attendees, oh, right. we're up to 12 attendees. Anybody, any, uh, any members of the public want to make any comments? Okay. Not seeing any. Okay, why don't we uh, go ahead with our vote to continue this hearing to May 4th. Do we need a time certain, Chris? Uh, why don't you say um, 6.35 if, if Pam agrees with that. Um, Pam is my sanity check. My problem with that, Chris, is uh, I did not bring a clipboard with me. So I do believe, to the best of my knowledge, that we can do 6.35. I think so, right. too. Yeah. So, uh, Johanna, uh, are you all right with amending your motion to include the time of 635 on May 4th. I love that amended version. <laughs> okay. And Jack, you still second? Okay, I see a thumb. So we will conclude that you second the amended motion. All right, so we'll go through a roll call. Uh, Maria? Approve. And Jack? Approve. Tom? Hey. And Janet? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And uh, Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. Okay, Tom and John, thank you very much. And I guess we'll see you in a month. Great. Thanks so much. Bye. See you. Okay, the time is 7.40. And we'll go on to item four in our agenda. This is a second public hearing, SPR 2022-12 Amherst Office Park LLC at 19 Research Drive. Request site plan review approval under section 3.358.1 of the zoning bylaw to add an entry into office suite one with a covered porch. Project includes removing the existing window and moving a, an HVAC unit to the north and adding 68 square feet of love, a lot coverage. The applicant also requests modification of SPR 2002-00001 Amherst Professional Park phase two by removing condition number six regarding visitor trips and by modifying condition number seven by accepting new landscaping plan for landscaping at the entry. Concerning map 21B parcel 82 in the PRP Professional Research Park zoning district. Do we have any board disclosure on this this evening? 
Uh, okay, so I see Mr. Lavertier has been brought in as the, the applicant. Uh, good evening, Ron. How are we doing? Good to see you. Uh, do you have a presentation you'd like to make? And after you, we will have the site visit report. I see Chris's hand actually. So Chris, do you want to introduce this before Ron starts? I don't want to introduce it, but I want to acknowledge the fact that Nate Malloy is here and he's been managing this project and he may have some uh, introduction, introductory comments that he would like to make. Um, so, uh, okay. Recognize you. Him. Do you want to say anything? No, thanks. Um, well, Ron, go. I mean, it's a, not a complicated project. And I think the development application report, you know, clarified everything. So nothing at this time. Okay. Thank you. Ron, you're on. Okay. Um, it's a pretty simple project. We want to remove a window and put an entry door into um, Office Suite 1 um, that you have plans for. Our goal here is um, Hart and Patterson originally owned the whole building and uh, occupied probably 90% of it and uh, rented about 10%. Uh, their, their, the model for their business has changed. Uh, you know, they do a lot more, um, have they do a lot more work, um, out of the office and, uh, use the office pretty much, uh, to have meetings with their, with, with their clients and, and they wanted to shrink. So, um, we, we struck a deal and, uh, I ended up buying the building and, um, I'm in the process of working through um, making it into six suites and, um, you know, so, so they wanted their own entrance and I, I said I would try to comply with that. Um, we were proposing a, a, a little bit of a walkway, a covered entry area. It will all, it will be handicap accessible and um, we're going to move one plant to the north. And we're actually going to remove the uh, air conditioning units that that's there that was originally placed there for um, the big servers they used to have upstairs. And the servers no longer in use and they've been removed from the building so we don't need to actually cool that area with additional cooling. So we'll be just taking that air conditioning unit out. Um, I, that's the, you know, the crux of the, the main uh, the, the work on the site. And uh, I'm going to go back to condition six, which is um, back in 2002 when we were, uh, we proposed this building. Um, site visits by um, the public were, were not allowed in the PRP. And you know, there was some discussion as to whether, you know, being a fight, whether somebody's financial um investment was actually a business to business relationship um and uh, so uh, the board at the time found it reasonable to have one visit a day um coming into the building so they could have uh, on-site meetings um the world has changed dramatically since then and the zoning has changed since then um now uh PRP has been rezoned so that you can you can have um, uh, a, a reasonable number of um, of office visits by appointment, and uh, that's you know all their all their office visits are by appointment, and certainly anybody renting the space would fall under that category, and uh, you know so that one traffic visit a day uh, we'd like to get removed because it doesn't fit. Uh, the zoning uh, that was changed uh, in the, I would say, late 2000s. Okay. Um, so we had site visit for this project as well yesterday. Uh, Johanna or, J or Janet, do you either of you want to hit start us off? And I was present as well. Johanna. Sure, I'd be happy to. So we, um, we met at the site, we started by just looking at where the new portico would be built 
and how it intersects with the sidewalk there and the removal of an air conditioner unit. Um, from there, we walked over to the kind of boundary of the property and uh, talked about the current, I believe, 100 foot buffer that's there with the adjacent property and how we would, how there are plans in place to potentially fell some of those trees and um, reduce that to the required 50 foot buffer, I think. Um, and uh, that there would be negotiations, you know, down the road with the uh, owner of the adjacent property to explore that. Um, and then we walked to the driveway where the um, this building's park parking area intersects with Research Drive and discussed the plans for the signage for the building. That's it. Unless anybody has right. anything to add. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Janet, do you want to add anything? Um, just if I think that Research Drive is a private way and it's maintained by the building owners. And there's four, it's kind of a surprising site I've never been to. There's like four large office buildings with like parking lots for each of them. And so two of the buildings are owned by Mr. Ver Laverdier and one is by Kate Atkinson and I lost Dr. Atkinson. I, I forget who the other person was, but um, they're kind of nestled away and they seem to be right next to a small apartment complex. And then also um, a residential neighborhood neighborhood of single family homes. That's actually hard to see because there's so many trees. It's easier to see the apartments next door. Um, but it, you know, all the buildings were you know, pretty attractive and well-maintained and landscaped. Um, it was kind of private. Like I never even knew it really was all there until I showed up and stuff like that. So, but every, every building has its own parking lot. Great. All right, thank you. All right, um, questions from the board, Jack. I have to say, I, I, I have been a, um, a working uh, participant uh, on Research Drive for how many years, <laughs> Ron? Uh, uh, is, this a, is this a board disclosure, Jack? It, it's, a, it's a disclosure, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm familiar with it, as I'm saying. But I, I, I do want to say that I, uh, I, I think Ron has done a great job in terms of you know, providing, you know, you know, increased housing and commercial, you know, stock within the town. And, uh, you know, he brings a lot of ingenuity uh, into his project. So uh, just wanted to say that about Ron. Okay, thank you, Jack. Uh, are there other questions from the board? Janet. Um, I have a question about what the current requirement in PRP or limits on visitors is there like a cap in the number of visitors or just that everybody has to be by appointment? I, I and, and is there a bylaw section I can look at? Uh, Nate, would you uh, like to Nate, that? do you want to answer that? Sure, yeah. So after this building was permitted by site plan review, the zoning changed, right? So um, in the development application report, it was originally there was just one kind of office category and now there's three. So 3.358, uh, point one is you know technical or professional offices and some of those conditions in the use chart is um okay you know visits by appointment and so it doesn't have a limit it, it almost actually is um it says predominantly by appointment and it makes it seem as if the first visit can be by appointment but then a, any follow-up visit can just be as necessary so it's uh flexible language um but initially you know every visit has to be by appointment but it doesn't limit you know, daily trips or, or number of, of visits, you know, per day or, or any limitation like that. Okay, thanks, Min. thanks, Nate. Well, I have a couple of questions. I'm not seeing a lot of hands from the board. Um, one question I had was about the sidewalk that the new entry to the new portico. Um, I, I don't see any real detail for that grade change that's necessary for the sidewalk to get to the new front door and elevate. Uh, so Chris, actually, I wondered, um, is it typical for us to accept, uh, you know, to, to approve projects that don't have full sort of an actual engineering design or, or that are stamped from an engineer or an architect? 
Um, that is not typical. Um, this is um, a very small project and um, you could ask for information about the elevation of the, the floor level and the elevation of the sidewalk if you want that information and then the slope could be calculated. Um, so that would be something that wouldn't be too hard to obtain. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the, uh, the site plan that uh, Harold Eaton pr pr proposed does hat cross hatch the area of the, of the sidewalk, but um, you know, particularly on entries with ADA and the mass access board and the kind of regulations and specific limits on slopes, I just wondered if that was something we might want to push for. But uh, Chris, if, if when Ron went for his uh, building permit, would that be required anyway? That will be looked at when Ron goes for his building permit. You could have a condition that says that that access must be handicapped accessible. Right. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, the building code would would require it to be handicapped accessible anyway. So I don't yes. know that we need to add that. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, the other question I had was about, there were several photos included. Um, one was a photo of a light fixture and it, it, I just wondered why we had that photo. <laughs> That it's, not photo, it's not obviously dark sky compliant that you're, so it's, it wasn't clearly a fixture you were gonna be proposing to use. So what, what was that for? That photo of the light fixture is the, is the light fixture that will hang in the portico. So once it's in the portico, it's, it's basically dark sky compliant. It's shielded, yeah. Yes, so that, that, I mean, that's, you know, it, it'll be above the, um, the level to which the, uh, the trim boards go around. So, you know, that would make, you know, okay. it, it's just a very nice LED fixture that I kind of like the way it looks. So that's okay. why I, I took you. a picture and, of and I assume, I assume the photo of the front door is probably the existing front door and you're gonna duplicate that in yes, the new entry? Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, Tom, or, or uh, before we get to Tom, Chris, do you wanna, Comment? Yeah, I don't think it would hurt to put on a condition that says that that um, sidewalk from the sidewalk up to the door needs to be handicapped accessible. It sort of calls it out to the um, building inspectors who are looking at the plans as okay. something that you talked about and want to make sure that it occurs, right? Okay, yeah. All right, Tom. Thanks, uh, I'm not gonna argue about it, I'm not actually sure that that's the case because you can access Office Suite 1 through the main entry. And so I don't think it would be required that that is also a handicap accessible entrance. If you have a handy made the main entrance is handicap accessible. So I don't know the rules on that, but my guess is that we may not actually have to require that given that you have that interior access from the vestibule. So I, I'm, to tell me I'm wrong, I, I support all these entrances being handicap accessible, but I'm, I'm guess what I'm saying is I don't know if they can hold us accountable or we can hold them accountable, given <clears throat> given the law. Okay, good good point, Tom. Uh, Nate, do you have a comment? Oh no, sure. Yeah, I talked to Rob Moore, the building commissioner. So on work performed, it has to be accessible if the public uses it. So if the public is going to be going into that, you know, into or out of that entrance, it, you know, building code would require it. So. Um, you know, even if it's a back entrance, right, if this were work performed on essentially a back door, but public would be using it would need to be fully accessible. So, you know, the only, uh, you know, my only caveat here would be if it's steep enough, it might need railings, right? Um, you know, I'm assuming you can map, get the slope of the, the transition up to the landing of the, of the entry. It just may be, you know, if it's over a certain percentage, it might need railings, but I think, you know, I think it can be managed. Yeah, and that that could be part of Rob's review for for building permit. Right. I mean, it says on the plans it won't. It'll be you know lower than that slope. So it you know essentially it's a sloped walkway, not a ramp. So it doesn't need railings. Right. Okay. All right. Are there other uh, board questions or board discussion? 
All right, we'll, we'll go uh, offer public comment. Members of the public, attendees, all 10 of you, uh, would anyone like to make a comment on this, on this project? I don't see any hands. Okay. Mr. Marshall, okay, one has Chris, popped up. I'm sorry, Pam? One public comment hand has popped up. Oh, all right. Oh, good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, Gigi Barnhill, we will move you over into the participants and you can make your comment. Give us your name and your address. Right. Um, I'm Gigi Barnhill, Georgia Barnhill, and my husband, Jim Barnhill, 54 Larkspur Drive. We're just wondering about the tree trimming aspect of this. Um, and because uh, we like the full buffer, is there some reason to cut that back by half? All right. Thank you. Um, oh. Excuse me. I'd like to say it also with their. Would that be part of, I, I'm hoping that would not be part of the permit that he would get at this point. All right, thank you. And, and I will say that I don't believe that that buffer and the trees on it are a part of the, uh, the approvals or the deliberation that we're having this evening. Uh, it did come up in the site plan review or the, uh, or the rather the uh, site visit we made yesterday. Um, but it was sort of an ancillary conversation and, and was just sort of, uh, Ron wanted to show us that area because I think at some point in the future, he thought we might be asked to, to, to think about it. Ron, do you wanna make any comments on that topic? Well, you know, the big worry right now is the, you know, that, that, that lot that sits between 54 Larkspur and 19 Research Drive is heavily populated with white pine and white pine is um, is having some issues and you know there those trees may become dangerous to the point where they're you know they're capable of both falling on my building and 54 Larkspur Drive uh, you know Nate actually uh, gave me quite a bit of information that has been done by uh, the forestry department I believe at UMass and so that that's why I um you know I'm even thinking of removing some trees and that will be you know something that would be addressed in the future it's certainly not part of this this process but you know and you know the barn hills um I think probably should get that same information <laughs> and you know so they can make a, a um a, a good choice as to whether you know if these trees start getting weaker um, they certainly don't want a tree coming down on their house. Mm -hmm. And so okay. that's, you know, but this will be, a, you know, a private conversation that I'm happy to have um, with them as neighbors. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and I want to protect my building and I'm sure they want to protect theirs. All right. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Janet. Um, I don't have a question, but I, I did remember from the site visit that Mr. Laverdier said that the new sign that he wants to install will not be lit. And it, it seemed to be there were no changes in terms of increased or decreased lighting, except for the doorway, the new doorway. Um, I don't know if we need to mention that as a condition or, you know, since there's no additional lighting of that sign or anything like that. I know sign rigs are very complicated and lighting can be testy also. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Chris, do you want to comment on that at all? I don't think I have any comments on that. Um, but when we get to the end of this uh, process here, you may want to list some conditions like you usually do. And I don't know if Nate has um, made a list of possible conditions yet. OK. Well, we'll give some, him some time to scribble a few down. Uh, Jack. Uh, yes, I was going to move to close the hearing, but again, uh, subject to any conditions that I'm not uh, aware of. It seems like it's a fairly clean project, but uh, 
we'll defer to Nate uh, with regard to the conditions. But anyway, wanted to move that, that we close the, the, the hearing uh, subject to any conditions that are, you know, formulated during the deliberation. Okay. Uh, thank you for that motion. Tom? Uh, I'll second. All right. So board members, we have a motion on the floor to close the hearing. Uh, do we want to have some discussion of, of potential conditions or any other topics before we have a vote to close the hearing? So thus far, the, the conditions that I've heard were to require the new path to the new entry to meet accessibility requirements. And there was some question as to whether we needed to note that there was no lighting on the new sign. But Chris, it didn't seem like you had any comments on that. So having a condition for something that's already proposed seems a little bit unnecessary. You could have a condition that says um, that the new sign will be un unlit. Well, are we, do we want to prohibit lighting? I mean, or are we simply okay with it not being lit? If you don't want to drive out there someday and find a light and not and be surprised, you could say that um, the new sign will be unlit. Okay. I you know I, I don't want to um, muddy yeah. the waters, but it seemed like Mr. Laverdier didn't want to light the sign, you know, and thought that it was adequate that people's headlights could see that. Um, I do want to note there's like he's asking for five different waivers. Would we be discussing that after we close the hearing when we discuss conditions? No, we'll, we'll, con we'll discuss it now. Okay. I think we just at least go through them quickly. Right. All right. Um, Chris or Ron, do one of you want to lead us through the, um, the waiver requests? Maybe you want to ask Nate to do that because okay. Nate is more Sorry. familiar. Yes. Okay, Nate. Sure, thanks. And I was going to comment about the sign too. I think it's fine if you say it's an unlit sign as a condition just to reinforce the, the point. And so, you know, what the planning board is approving is actually the new survey, right? The site plan. So that shows, you know, there's like three site, three pole lights on the site. Um, and everything that's there. So I think, um, you know, I think the few conditions that were discussed is, is fine. So, um, you well, know, Ron, I mean, I'm sorry, Nate, but the second of the waivers says the lighting plan, the existing lighting is unchanged, right? except for a new hanging light in the new entry, which means there's no new light at a sign. Sure, but I think, you know, like Chris was saying, you know, it could be in the future that they would want to illuminate the sign or that it that happens. And so I know it's not indicated at all, but sometimes that, you know, they'll have a ground mount light, you know, up light on the sign. So I agree. So that's the, you know, that's the second waiver request is, a, you know, from a lighting plan because there's no changes other than the hanging light in the portico. Right. Um, you know, a waiver for the landscape plan, Ron mentioned, it shows on the plans, removal of one or two shrubs and a planting of one. Um, so, you know, there's really no significant changes in terms of the landscaping. Uh, requested a waiver from the erosion plan. I mean, there's no, no wetlands and it's a minimal, you know, there's 68 square feet of new, of new lot coverage. So it's a minimal disturbance to the ground. Um, a waiver from oh, a, a- So, so I'm sorry, but I, it took me a minute to realize, and let me, tell me if I've got this right. The waiver, for instance, for your first bullet under landscape plan, the waiver is not, we want to remove one shrub. The waiver is, we don't want to submit a landscape plan. Right. So we don't want to submit a landscape plan, a lighting plan, an erosion plan, and a sign plan, and a traffic impact statement. Those are the waivers. Right, so typically those would be, you know, those first three or four might be separate sheets, you know, developed by an architect, and then the the, the traffic one would be 
either a letter or a study done by an engineer. So the waiver request is for the right producing those documents. Okay. All right, thanks for that clarification. Chris, you still have your hand up, are you? Yeah, I wanted to um, clarify something. And that is that um, when Mr. Laverdier came in to us to um, propose what he has proposed, uh, he didn't have a survey of the property. He had um, something that was a partial plan um, based on the construction drawings for the building. So. Um, Mr. Mora, Rob Mora, the building commissioner um, recommended that we require a survey of the property. So he has gotten a survey of the property. So as part of what you're doing tonight um, is that you are acknowledging the receipt of this survey. And I think, you know, there's no reason to think that the survey isn't correct. So you might actually um, go as far as approving this this site plan, um, the way it's shown, and it's shown as the existing conditions, and then the, um, the the proposal to add the sidewalk, add the walkway, and move the shrub, and add the sign. So you're kind of approving this plan, even though it's not being built now. The whole thing isn't being built now. This is a survey that we are going to use going forward. So the next time Mr. Lavernier comes to us and says, "I want to add a," couple of parking spaces over in the corner, or I want to um, add another entry to another part of the building or whatever it is he might say that we have a starting point. And so acknowledging this survey and approving it as, you know, the survey of the property, I think would be, could be an important part of this um, process here. And maybe Nate wants to comment on that because he's spoken with the building commissioner more about this project than I have, but, but that may be a worthwhile step to take. Uh, Nate? No, I think Chris summarized it well. So, you know, as a site plan review, any documents associated with this become, you know, kind of they supersede anything in the past. And so really it's this new survey of existing conditions becomes what is being approved. And so, um, you know, there aren't many changes from what were approved previously when it was built, except for, you know, as Chris noted, what's, what's what Ron's recommending now or asking for now, the sign, the walkway, and, you know, the minor change to the landscaping. So, this becomes the new site plan for the property. So, so this is a, so this is actually a site plan review hearing. Yes. And so in, so we're going to be accepting the site plan. And the questions uh, regarding the waivers is whether we accept it in the absence of the five or six documents that are typically prepared. Mm -hmm. Yes. Would that be accurate? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so is there more, dis well, I, I think, do we have any more discussion of this? Are people, I mean, we can we can go ahead and have our vote to close the hearing, uh, and then we're going to need to have another vote uh, on this site plan review. Um, does anybody want to have any more discussion before we have those two votes? I think it's better to get all the discussion done and then go through both votes as part of the hearing. Okay, so not seeing any hands. And uh, so, all right, Jack, your, your motion is on the floor and I forget who seconded, maybe Tom. Um, so we'll go through and move. This is a motion to close the hearing. Uh, Maria. Approved. And Jack. Approved. And Tom. Aye. All right. And um, Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I'm an aye as well. All right, so the time is 8.11 and the hearing is closed. Now um, I will uh, ask if anybody wants to say anything else about this topic. Not seeing any hands. So we'll go ahead into the vote to, so uh, I need a motion for, 
accepting the site plan and accepting the site plan review without uh, the one, two, three, four, five documents that were requested as a waiver. So that would be the, the landscape plan, the lighting plan, erosion plan, siting plan, and traffic impact statement. Does anybody want to make that motion? Johanna. I move to approve the site plan without the five documents or granting the waivers for the five documents. Okay. Thank you, Johanna and Jack. Yeah, uh, as, as uh, moved there by Johanna. So you'll second that. Now, is this the final uh, motion that you're going to make? Because you may want to include um, the, the conditions um, that it satisfies the requirements of section 11.24, the criteria of section 11.24, the relevant criteria. Um, you usually don't go through all of the criteria for a small project like this and then establish conditions and you may want to roll the conditions into this um, motion. Right. Okay, so Johanna, we may need to go through this again. Let's so, do it. Or, or, or amend it that we, we've had two conditions we've talked about. One is that the entrance would be accessible and the other is that there be no illumination of the new sign. And um, normally you also have a condition that says that this uh, project will be built according to the approved plan. Right. Um. Doug, is it okay if I just amend my motion to include those three conditions? Uh, yes, it's fine with me. And I'll second. Okay. Okay, so we'll go ahead and have a vote. Maria. Approve. And Jack. Approve. And Tom. Aye. And Janet. Aye. Johanna. Aye. And I'm an I as well. All right. So the time is 11:14. We, I believe, we have concluded item four on our agenda, and uh, we'll take a five-minute break. We'll come back at 8:20. Uh, to continue with the next item on the agenda. Please turn off your cameras and mute your microphones.
All right, time is 8.20 and we are coming back into activity. Looks like we've got a couple more people to arrive. Okay, Chris, we've got everybody back but Nate. Do we need Nate for the Wagner uh, subject? You sort of shook your head no. I forgot I was muted. I'm back. Okay. Okay. We don't, don't, need well, we don't So you are saying we don't need to wait for Nate? No waiting for Nate, no. Okay. All right. So... All right, so the time is 821. We are ending our break and we are resuming the agenda with item five, a review of management plan and site plan. This is for SBR 2022, <clears throat> excuse me, dash 07. James and Joseph Wagner, uh, Wagner Wood, uh, 305 Northeast Street. Um, Chris, are the Wagners here this evening or are, will we be discussing their submissions without them? You will be discussing um, the submissions without them. And I don't think Mr. Reedy's here any longer either, is he? I don't see him in the attendees. No, I don't see him either. Yeah, okay. so I don't think he was um, proposing to be here either. So I'll just explain that um, as you know, you approved the uh, Wagner Farm stand back in January. We finally got the um, decision written and it was signed um, this week and filed with the town clerk. And there were two items that were kind of hanging out there. And one was the um, a revised site plan showing um, at least one new handicapped um, parking space closer to the building. And um, they have submitted a site plan showing that. And the other thing was that they changed their management plan to allow them to be open um, a little bit longer. I think it was from dawn until eight o'clock in the evening. So if Pam could bring up um, the site plan and the management plan for that uh, project, it was part of your packet towards the very end. Right. And you could have... Um, decide whether you're going to approve those two things or not. And I have to confess that um, Tom Reedy submitted these things on January 20th, which was the day after the public hearing, and I'm just now bringing them to you, so I apologize for that. Pam, hey, I think, yeah, I think they're a little later. This is the decision, which you just signed. Yeah. And this is the management, management plan. plan. A bit. So back up a bit, Pam. Back oh, yes. up. Okay, okay. Back up to the first page of that. Yes, so there it is. Lighting as shown on the elevation business hours will be from dawn until no later than 8 p.m., seven days a week, with adequate lighting to be provided as necessary during those times. So those were the things that um, the board was concerned about when they reviewed this in the management plan to get clarity on what the hours of operation were and what the lighting was going to be. Would we, if we, this, this lighting would need to be dark sky compliant, no? Yes, I think that's taken care of in the in the um, in the decision. Decision. <clears throat> I hope it is taken care of in the decision. Yes, site lighting shall be dark sky compliant and cold compliant, and shall not shine onto adjacent properties, and shall be adequate for the purpose of lighting the area where people are walking and driving for the safety of the pedestrians. The path from the parking areas to the main entry of the farm stand shall be adequately lit. That's condition number seven. And um, Janet had some questions about the adequacy of the way we represented the issue about lighting um, during the public hearing. So we went back and we listened to the 
um, to the recording of the hearing and we um, made changes to the minutes of January 19th to reflect this issue of lighting. And we also um, made those, uh, those, that topic, we clarified that topic in the decision that you just signed. So there's more about lighting there. Okay. And of course we have this statement about lighting here in the management plan now. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, anything on the second page that we wanna talk about? I don't think so. Uh, is there Pam? Let's see. I don't think they've changed anything on the second page. Nope. All right. So why don't we go to the site plan? Mm -hmm. So the site plan, as you can see, um, they have um, handicapped parking on the uh, south side of the site. They have a, a handicapped space there with a, an access aisle. I think there are two handicapped spaces there, actually. But then they've added one, and it's labeled ADA, and it's up by the entry um, to the building. So that was uh, that. That was also in response to a comment that Janet made about um, having a long way to travel from the originally proposed handicapped spaces over to the entry to the building. So this is the new um, the new site plan. Okay. All right, board members. Uh, any comments on these? Uh, do they seem to meet the requirements that, or the concerns that we had when we had our hearing in your memory? Um, Janet? I think, I, I, I think they do, and it's great to get this plan. I know there was some concern about um, where the signs would be for pedestrian safe, safety because there's trucks, huge trucks going in and out. And so it's looking at this plan, it's really clear where the signs will go. So I, I think this is great. Okay. It's very helpful. Good, thanks. Any other board members, uh, any comments? Seeing at least a couple of shaking heads. Uh, Janet, I'll assume that's a legacy hand and call on Johanna. Thank you. Um, yeah, appreciate seeing this again. I was just trying to wrap my head around the lighting because I remember there was lighting attached to the house that then shined down, but if it's, you know, eight o'clock PM is pretty dark um, in winter months. And so, and I'm having a hard time telling on this exactly where the lighting is gonna be. I don't know if anybody. Uh, Pam, familiar. could you blow this up a little bit? Mm -hmm. Go from 66% to 75, yeah. Is that too big? No, that's fine. Uh, why don't you pan a little to the left? There we go. Okay. Okay. So I see a the word motion light on house. Uh, there it is. Yeah. May I describe it? May I describe sure. the? Sure. Go ahead, Chris. There are three uh, what are essentially floodlights mounted on the back of the house, pointing east, and those are um, motion sensitive. Um, those can be brighter or dimmer, depending on what kind of bulb you put in them. So um, Mr. Reedy has said that if it proves that those aren't bright enough, um, new bulbs could be put in. Um, but right now there are three of them and they point east and they, he says that they cover the area where the travel traveling would be. Um, then there's another light. Um, there's at least one other light at the entry. And it looks like from this uh, plan that there are actually two lights at the entry. Um, they have two little circles and the entry is at the Southwest corner of the, of the new building. Then there's another light um, on the North side of the building at the porch. And those lights are kind of a, it's like a pie plate with a little bump on top of it and the light hangs down. So those are dark sky compliant. Um, in addition to that, there's a light on, on a pole that's existing, and that's down near where the north arrow is towards the bottom of this plan. Um, and that is on from dusk till dawn. Um, and maybe, yes, that's exactly where it is. So there are, there's a light there on the pole. There are three lights on the new building and three floodlights on the house pointing east. 
Um, the floodlights on the house won't bother anyone else because the um, Wagners own all the property around here. So they're not going to be spilling over into somebody's, somebody else's property. So does that, um, does that satisfy? There yeah. is also. I'm satisfied, thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. Any other board comments? Uh, not seeing any. Do we have any public comment on this on this site plan or the management plan? <clears throat> don't, don't see any <clears throat> hands there either. Okay, Chris, we need a formal vote for these two documents. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Could we have um, a motion to approve the site plan and the management plan as submitted by the applicant? Jack, uh, Jack you were muted. Uh, as uh, so moved. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And Tom? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right, any other uh, comments before we vote? Not seeing any. All right, we'll go backwards this time. Johanna. Aye. And Janet. Aye. All right, I'm an aye. Tom. Aye. Jack. I'm going, uh, instead of aye, I'm going to approved. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Jack. I'm so confused. I'm so confused by that. <laughs> Okay, that's you. All six votes are in favor of various flavors. <laughs> okay, the time is eight thirty-two, and we're finished with item five. We'll go on to item six: um, proposed work in the ED zoning district uh, concerning an Amherst College new accessible entrance on their service building at 6 East Drive. Uh, Pam will want to bring up a, the drawings for that. And Chris, do you want to introduce it? Um, I will introduce it and also recognize the fact oh. that, um, let's see. I Seth, think Seth, Seth Wilshire Seth. has Seth. joined us. I didn't yeah. realize we were going to have someone from Amherst College here. So mm -hmm. Seth may want to present it. If he does, I will back down, but if not, then I can explain what's going on. Okay, Seth, welcome. And I presume you do want to discuss your project. I'm really just here to answer any questions that come up. Uh, I, I'm happy to let Chris take the lead. <laughs> unless, you, unless you'd rather not. I, I think we should bring up the drawings and Seth, you should just All right, say I will. as much or as little as you want to say about them. Uh, so that we've at least shown the images for the public, uh, and you have represented Amherst College on this, this uh, you know, significant project. If you don't right. mind, may I just make a statement to set the stage? Sure. So um, we're not asking the planning board to approve this project because it's outside of the jurisdiction of um, the planning board regarding uh, zoning. But there is a requirement section, I think it's section 3.211 of the zoning bylaw that requires that um, uh, entities that are developing things in the ED zoning district present plans to the planning board for its information prior to initiation of construction. So um, Amherst College is presenting these plans to you for your information. And you're welcome to comment, of course, but um, there's no approval required. OK. Thanks for that clarification, Chris. All right. Um, Seth, Are you going to pull them up on your on your? I was just going to ask you that, Seth. I have them on a PDF. Do you have a clearer version than that? If the PDF is not clear? Well, we can go ahead and take a look at it. It's a scam PDF, so I wasn't oh, okay. sure. Um, yeah, if you had just give me one. Yeah, I do, Just I just need one second. Okay. 
Sorry, I wasn't planning on uh, being the one to pull them up. Give me a one second. Uh, and then I have I have permission to share my screen. Okay. Yes. Here we go. Mm -hmm. I don't actually. This may not be exactly the set you have, but this is the set I have immediately uh, handy. Um, so let me just. Uh, yeah, that's these are the images that we've seen. We've got. All right. So this is the facilities and police building on East Drive. It is. Uh, the police are in the northern section of the, of the building here. This is East Drive here. College Street is off uh, in this direction. Um, Amherst College has a long plan to address accessibility issues on our campus. And this one has been a high priority for a while. It was planned two years ago and was canceled uh, or postponed, I will say, because of pandemic related uh, issues. And so we are finally trying to implement this project. So this project is primarily a accessible ramp to the front door. Um, there are a, there is a set of currently a set of stairs inside this front door, and so effectively we are taking those stairs and we are putting them outside the front door, and then also adding a ramp to get up there. We are also at the request of the um, Amherst College police chief adding a door operator to this door. It'll be a new door because the door is being lifted up the number of stairs that we have here. And then uh, we are doing a limited amount of interior work around one of the restrooms, um, as well as kind of redoing all the paving, resetting the curb. There's a bunch of ancillary work that kind of uh, has to be done to make this kind of all function. But the primary point of the project is to provide an accessible entrance to the first floor of this building, which is our police station. And we have a need for students for various reasons who have to get to the police station. And um, we have some um, students that require accessibility right now, and there's just simply no way to get there. So that's what we are aiming to fix. All right, thank you. I, the packet had a uh, first floor plan Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you could go to that too? I can. One second. Sorry, there's a lot of drawings here. Uh, so That's it. here yeah. we are. There you go. That's it. Yeah, so this is the new stair. This is infill where the existing stair is. The ramp comes up this way, up this way, up this way. The first two legs are below the Massachusetts Access Board requirement for um, needing handrails because they're below 5%. So the first two legs don't have handrails and then this section does have a handrail. Uh, this is a new door and a door operator on that door. This is a new vestibule door just because we had to put a new door in to make it kind of all work. And then they're returning an existing uh, three fixture men's room into a single fixture men's room and a gender inclusive room. Um, there, this will be the only gender inclusive restroom in the building um, and it'll be on the accessible level. The police department is this space that's on the page left on the north side of the building. Will the inner door of the vestibule also have an operator? It won't, but it's on hold open. It's almost never closed. Oh, okay. It actually has no hardware on it either. So um, it's just a free swinging door with no hardware. Okay. Okay, thank you, Seth. Um, so this is just for information for the board. Uh, members, are there any questions or comments you wanna make about them, about this uh, project? Janet. Um, I think this is great to, to make the building more accessible, especially such an important one. Um, I had two questions. One of them was, um, I the diagram I had didn't show the parking spaces around, I know they're all around the building. And I was wondering um, how close the ADA, space, sp ADA spaces were to the ramp. I can show you. Uh, this is one second, I think plan. 
So they are across the street. So this parking here is all designated police parking. So the police have a side entrance that comes in over here. So this is all police. So there, and then this is temporary delivery parking and then there's staff parking back here. So the only kind of available parking uh, is right here. So this is the ADA space right there. And so, so space eleven is is the closest space to the ramp. Am I? I'm, I'm space eleven. Yeah. So, uh, apologies. This plan is is slightly old. Uh, space eleven doesn't actually exist anymore. There's a big tree here we're tr we're trying to take. So actually, these two spaces don't exist. So we should only count one through nine. Um, and um, and it is the closest, but we lose two spaces by making a space there because. The crosswalk is here, and the crosswalk is aligning. It's a little hard to tell because it goes off the page here. But the crosswalk is aligning with the existing sidewalk, uh -huh. and by allowing us to to use this space as the required adjacency space that no one can park in for a wheel, for a van accessible spot, we don't have to take up two spaces to get a space in. So this is the the route. So you park here, and then you have a path, right? And then you go. You know, obviously would go up. And if you're not parking here, if you're just coming from another place on campus, right, you'd be coming across this path too. Okay. And Seth, wouldn't it be true that at least for students, most of the people, most of the students are not parking before they come to this building. They are there. No students are parking anywhere around here because there is no student parking anywhere in this vicinity. There is student parking um, across the railroad tracks but there's no accessible route from those locations. Um, so accessible, in terms of accessible parking that a student could use, they would not be coming from, from here, unless it was a, you know, they could be parking for immediate, you know, for an immediate use if they right. came and parked solely to come to our building. But if they were coming from somewhere else on campus, they wouldn't be parked in, in this vicinity. So, and then, so the parking that, um... Spaces one through eleven would be visitor parking then potentially. No, oh. no. So who parks? Um, no, we uh, we those spaces are reserved for facility vehicles and for uh, in, in a couple of cases for uh, geology vehicles uh, because this is our primary maintenance mechanical and plumbing shop right here, and there their facility vehicles occupy the majority of these spaces. And then geology, which is a building right here, gets two of them too. So visitor parking is across the parking lot. Okay, so somebody who needs an ADA spot could go into those two spots. Yes. Okay. So the, the other question I had was um, thinking about New England in ice, particularly in our new climate and not having the handrails on the, the first section, because that was the first thing that popped out. It looks really attractive as a ramp, but I wondered if it was icy conditions and someone had mobility issues, if they'd want to grab onto something. Um, not saying anything. Yeah, so I mean, no sidewalk, right, would ever have a handrail, right? And almost all of them are steeper all over the city than than 4.8%, right? So this is, you know, it, it's, um, you know, the idea is to make it as gracious as possible. And 5% is both the ADA and the Massachusetts Architectural Access Board regulation for where you need a handrail. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to really kind of try to make it less impactful on the, on a building. Now, this is a McKinley to White uh, iconic building on campus, one of you know one of many we have of theirs, but one of the better ones. And so we're trying to be really respectful to the building. We do have a way to drain. That's what these little um, I'll call them scuppers are here and here. There's a drain at the top. And so we're trying to funnel water off the ramp as much as possible. And then of course our groundskeepers maintain it um, in terms of ice removal. But um, yeah, we are not proposing to put, put handrails on the non-technical ramp sections. So, so I just, I appreciate the aesthetics of it, but I, having spent quite a bit of time with um, um, people with mobility issues and you know very slow movers, I think some kind of, subtle but attractive handrail would be really helpful to somebody who's having trouble moving if somebody has a walker you know just or you know a, a cane i think having a handrail would maybe you could put it on the wall so it's not as noticeable but i think it would be really helpful to someone 
Um, and then also we have a disability access, disability committee that maybe you could check in with and get some ideas from too. So that's those are my comments. All right, thank, thank you. you, Janet. Um, Jack. Uh, I heard geology. I just want to say I'm all over it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do agree, you know, uh, with Janice's comments about, you know, accessibility. So um, that's all. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Any other comments from the board? All right. Any comments from any of our public attendees? Mr. Marshall, just to let you know, I can't see that when uh, Seth's screen being shared. Okay, so thanks, Pam. Uh, I can see that, and I do not see any hands. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, thank you, Seth. Um, thanks for showing us what you're planning, and I hope you'll take our comments into consideration as you finalize and move forward. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Good night. Night. Okay, so the time now is 8.46. We're up to item seven on the agenda, fees for public hearing legal ads. Chris, this is yours, I believe. You are Excuse muted. Me. Oh, there, yeah. there you go. I'd like to talk to the planning board about this a little bit. Um, so right now, when someone files an application with the planning board, site plan review, special permit, um, subdivision plan, there's a fee associated with that. And the fee is supposed to have some relationship to how much time it takes to review it. It doesn't really relate to it at all. It takes way more time. But anyway, um, that's uh, beside the point. Um, we also have a an adjunct fee that we've been charging really for the past maybe five years or so. Um, which is nominally for the legal ad, but um, the fee that we charge is only $75 for the legal ad. And it turns out that um, legal ads are actually much more expensive than that. And they've gotten even more expensive recently. And I think there are a few reasons why they've gotten more expensive. One is we have this all this um, introductory language about virtual meetings and you know having to find links and if you want to join by your phone and all of that but we also have um, a newspaper that is struggling and the newspaper doesn't have very many commercial ads anymore and so I think it's um, kind of leaning on its legal ads a little bit more than it has in the past and and some of our legal ads really cost a lot of money they cost you know, $600, $1,000. We have to run the legal ads two weeks in a row prior to a public hearing. It's part of the state law. Um, there are conversations about getting away from this requirement and somehow just posting things on a website rather than um, having to run it in a, in a paper. But right now the requirement is that you have to post the legal ad in a paper of general local circulation for this uh, for two two times in a period of two in a period of two weeks. So, anyway, what happens is um, we put money in our budget. We ask for money in our budget to pay for legal ads, and then we get this paltry seventy five dollars from the applicants, and it in no way pays for the legal ads. So right now we've got um, my budget is way over way overboard, and part of that is due to last year's. Um, you know, all of the zoning amendments that we worked on because we have to publish legal ads for those too. But what I'm coming to you tonight about is specifically related to applicants, um, you know, people who are trying to develop their property and um, need to come before the board. Um, in the past, we've felt that, well, you know, they're already, some of them are struggling, you know, like particularly somebody who just wants to do something relatively small um, he's not going to spend that much money on the project. We, we ask him for $75 for the legal ad. But now we're thinking maybe we should get the applicants to either share more of the expense or 
on the alternative to actually pay for the legal ad themselves. So I'm coming to you with um, kind of two separate ideas and I wanted to see what you thought about them. Um, because the planning board really does need to um, be able to regulate fees that it uh, charges. Um, so one of the ideas is to up the legal ad fee from $75 to $200 across the board. So every applicant would pay $200 for legal ad. That still doesn't cover the full cost of the legal ad, but at least it um, helps the town in paying for it. So <clears throat> that would be one alternative, one option. Um, the second option would be to actually require the applicant to pay for the legal ad um, entirely. And this is a little more complicated. Right now we have this very easy process where either Pam or I draft a legal ad, we send it around to Rob Mora and get approval on the draft, and then we send it right to um, the Gazette and they write back to us and say, okay, we're going to publish your legal ad these two days and here's how much it's going to cost. And that's fairly simple. Um, the, the second option that I was going to tell you about is that we would still send the legal ad to the Gazette, but then we would ask them to bill the applicant. And um, if they bill, or, so this gets more complicated, they could either bill the applicant or they could bill us. And if they bill us, then we have to chase the applicant to get the money out of them. And if they bill the applicant, then the Gazette has to chase the applicant to get the money out of them. So we're wrestling with how, how do we, how do we cope with this conundrum? Um, the way the Conservation Commission handles it is they um, submit the legal ad to the Gazette the same way that we do, and then they receive a bill from the Gazette. Um, meanwhile, the Gazette has given them an estimate of what this um, legal ad is going to cost, and the Conservation Commission staff tells the applicant, okay, give me a check for $586 or whatever it is, and, and they, the applicant gives the check to the staff person for the Conservation Commission, and then she pays the bill when it comes in from the Gazette. So the, really the two options are, as far as you're concerned, do we raise the fee to $200 and then the town kind of bears the burden of the rest of it, or do we actually try to get the applicant to pay for the actual legal ad? So I just wanted to have a, a discussion with you about that. And then if you want to decide tonight, um, that's okay. If you want to think about it a little bit and we can talk about it next time, that would be okay too. But I wanted to just get your feelings on the matter. <coughs> Tom, I see your hand. Thanks, Chris. Just one of the uh, comment that, um, that I see often in working with nonprofits and other kind of organizations through my business is a scale, right? So what we don't want to do is make it really hard for small businesses and startups to pay this fee. But then we also might recognize that there are large organizations that could easily pay this fee. And sometimes that fee might be scaled based on the size of an organization, the income or revenue of that organization, or some other really simple to, uh, to quantify value. And that way your small startup with zero revenue for that year could um, pay a small fee. And an organization that's been around for 10 years is looking to permit and add a big chunk onto their property, um, you know, could easily pay $600 for an ad. So just something to consider and sort of evaluating the applicants up front to scale that so that there's not a back and forth chasing people for those fees, but there's just, it's, they know ahead of time, it's going to be this number, this number, or this number based on how many employees or, or their annual revenue. So just a thought that might simplify that process and get you mm -hmm. where you want to be and not make it hard for small businesses. That's a good suggestion. Thanks, Tom. Maria? Um, thanks. Uh, that might be hard to ask for private information like that, Tom, as far as like how many employees and what's your annual 
uh, profit or whatever, but I, I think the building, uh, isn't the building um, permit fee based on square footage? So if someone's doing like a, a mega apartment complex, they can afford, you know, that additional fee versus a single family home. Isn't that by square footage, I think? And so that might be an easier way that's not like asking for, you know, uh, a business's sort of, you know, income. So, you know, square footage is a way to also kind of get a feel for that. I mean, I know that some nonprofits do do larger buildings, but by the time they're doing a project that size, they probably have, you know, the capital to pay for things like that. So mm -hmm. um, it's just another kind of similar to what Tom was saying. Yeah, that 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 idea came to my mind too. Um, I think the building permit is based on the dollar value of the construction that's going to be happening. And obviously at the beginning of a project when you're looking for permitting, you don't really know exactly, but you probably have some general sense of what you think you're going to, or what you have available to spend. Um, so it could be dollar value or it could be square footage. Um, you know, like the project we just saw, there's no, or, you know, if they were just building the ramp, there's, or, or even the project at Research Drive we saw tonight, there's no interior square footage. Uh, so, you know, do we, is it overall square footage or whatever? So anyway, that just some more ways to think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was going to ask, what's the average cost of one of these things? Because, uh, you know, does $200 come close to the average or is it, is the average actually 600? And, you know, we're, we're, by this increase we're doing, we're only getting from covering a quarter of the value to being, you know, a third of the value or something. Um, yeah, I could do, a, I could um, figure that out. My guess is the average is around four or five hundred dollars. All right. Well, the another thing that occurred to me was, um, you know, I know the Gazette is not flush with funding and you said maybe they were leaning heavily on legal ads. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to intentionally hurt them, but uh, would we meet the letter of the law if we advertised in the Republican and, 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 you know, maybe also posted on the town website just to make sure there was some local presence. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if the Republican meets the criteria for the state statute of where we post, but they might have a more reasonable uh, rate for legal ads. Mm -hmm. I can check that out. And you know, I don't know if there's any other papers that that might be worth considering. Mm. Uh, Janet, <clears throat> I was wondering what other local towns do. I don't know. It just, you know, like a few towns around us. Like, I know this was sort of discussed on the list, the Mass Planners list serv about using local papers when people have declining um, circulations and the ads being expensive. But I just wondered, you know, what is Hadley doing or Northampton or Granby or, you know, Sunderland? Mm -hmm. I can check with them. Also occurs to me, um, you know, could we be a little more severe on how we edit these ads so that they're shorter? Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe you took, you know, you, I'm thinking of the old telegram where every word counted and the only words you had were the essential parts of the message. Mm -hmm. yep. Nate, uh, I see your hand. Thanks, Doug. You, you just uh, made my point. I think, you know, we could, you know, try to make the legal ads more concise. I would say that, you know, probably 90% of a legal ad is formulaic. So no matter what the project is, the cost is there, right? So the cost of the legal ad doesn't necessarily change much by the size of the project because, you know, a, a description of the project and property is a small portion of a legal ad. It's the whole standard, you know, intro to the hearing. So I think a sliding scale could be difficult because really the, you know, how that impacts the cost of a legal ad is small, but I do think we could try to make it 
a little bit more concise in the language. And I agree with Janet, the Mass Planners Listserv has been discussing this. And it's interesting that um, you know, some people are really advocating for getting rid of this in print requirement. So uh, there's some discussion about whether or not it's actually statutory. Um, some attorneys say yes, and some seem to say no. But I think uh, after uh, the pandemic, I think some um, there may be some you know, recommendations to change the statute so that it doesn't necessarily have to be in print you know, in, a, in a newspaper. So there could be other ways. But you know, our understanding right now is that it has to be, Doug, to your point, it has to be in a, a newspaper in print in general circulation. So you know, the Republican may, may meet that, but the Gazette is you know, more widely distributed in Amherst. So if we're going by kind of the intent of the law, that's probably where it would need to be published. Um, you know, if changes to the open meeting law happen too, in terms of remote meetings, I don't know if then public hearing notifications will come next, uh, in the next year or so, but for now it's supposed to be in print. Okay. Thanks, Nate. So Chris, I, think, I don't, I don't I'll know do if this was helpful, but you've gotten a few ideas. Yeah. I'll do some research and calling around as Janet suggested and try to get a sense of what the, um, average legal ad is and um and come back to you with that information um so thank you yeah, and, and I, I i do think if you come back with a sliding scale it ought to be you know the bottom end ought to be some fraction of the average and the top end ought to be some multiple of the average you know we don't get a lot of 20 million dollar projects in town so that one ought to be paying a lot and you know 10 times the average or whatever just to make up because it's i mean i'm not sure that's how we want to be spending our town funding mm -hmm. okay all right good okay. this is cool. yep all right so moving on it's 902 um chris do we have any old business item eight i do not have any old business all right. Do I? The next item is new business topics not reasonably anticipated. How we about that? Have, we do have new business. Um, we don't necessarily have to discuss it in depth tonight. Um, we can put it on the agenda for the next time. But um, the town manager has reached out to us to um, re recruit a representative of the planning board to sit on the solar bylaw working group. And um, it's a group of um, seven, uh, seven members. Um, and I think the Conservation Commission will have a representative, um, ECAC, and let me see if I can remember what that stands for, environmental, I can't remember, energy and uh, <laughs> my, my I brain. I believe it was Energy and Climate Action Committee. Thank you. That would have come out easier at about six o'clock this evening instead of now. Um, so ECAC and I think that the Conservation Commission um, Planning Board and the Watershed Supply Protection Committee. Yeah, Water, Water Supply uh, Protection Committee, yes, Thank which you. I am on that. Uh, okay, thanks, Jack. Yeah. I, I wanted to just note that uh, at 9.02, Andrew McDougall arrived and joined our meeting. Oh. Am I late? Am I late or did I miss anything? <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Andrew. Andrew, you need you, you. Never mind. Okay, um, I'm glad so, you could make it. So the so, um, board is being invited to um, to designate a representative, and then that representative would be um, appointed by the town manager. This is a group that's appointed by the town manager, and it would follow all the usual open meeting law requirements. I checked with the town manager on that today. But you may um, want to, I think I sent you a copy of the charge this week, didn't I? A copy of the town manager's um, email to us and the charge. So you may want to uh, go home and think about that and think about whether you would like to be a member of this group. Um, some people may want to ask questions or make statements about whether they'd like to be a member tonight. But I, I would suggest that since it wasn't on the agenda that we don't talk too much about it, but I wanted to uh, certainly introduce the topic. Okay. I did see in that email from the town manager that 
uh, it was expected to have a fairly significant time commitment and that they may meet twice a month. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously if you if you're on the planning board already and you're meeting twice a month with us, uh, it could be a doubling of your time commitment, at least for meetings and then whatever research is needed in between. Mm -hmm. Jack. Yeah, uh, I just want to say that, you know, I, I would love to be on that committee, but I, I do anticipate, you know, stepping down uh, after two terms um, as of June. Uh, I will be on the water supply you know, protection committee on, and I'm on the subcommittee where we're doing a white paper with regard to impacts to water resources, uh, which is, you know, coming along pretty good. But uh, just wanted to say that. Um, so you, you know, and probably Maria are really not candidates for this because you're coming off the, the board. Correct. I mean, yes. Okay. Yeah, well, I think but you know, I, I'm, I, feel, I feel very passionate about this. Um, you know, I feel like I have a lot of knowledge too, but may, you know, maybe through well, the water. I, I believe there will be a couple of at-large members. Isn't that true? I think so. I can't okay. remember. So Jack, if you really feel strongly, you might apply for one of the at-large positions. Yeah, but I, I know I'm already helping with regard to the, the, the water supply uh, protection committee. Uh, you know, the, we, we have the subcommittee that we're doing a white paper on the impact of the, you know, potential, you know, solar arrays and, and batteries on the water resources. So I'm, I'm doing that already. Good. And I may be, I may serve on that committee through that, but, you know, we have a couple other, you know, good people on the board. So we'll see. Uh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Janet. Um, I'm interested in serving on the committee um, and, you know, just because the topic is interesting to me and I, I hope I can add some legal heft to it or um, kind of as, as they work through the values and statements about the bylaw and things like that. But I, I do see it could be a, a bear of a job in terms of the committee's work um, is, and there's a staff person assigned to them, right? So that will... Um, the staff people are Stephanie Ciccarello and myself, okay. and I have recruited Nate to help me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, we're, you know, we're not going to have a very big staff, and I'm sure Pam will be recruited from time to time to help us out, but, um, yeah. But a capable staff. So. Capable. That's a good way to put it. <laughs> All right. So we will put this on the agenda for the next meeting. Yep. And uh, everybody, should everybody that's, should people, if they're interested, email you in, in the interim, yeah. or do you want to wait until the meeting to hear that? No, people could email me and I could make a list and okay. um, that would be a good thing to know. Yep. Okay. And I wanted to say one thing that I've heard recently that um, the six year limit on service is kind of a more of a guideline than a strict um, requirement. So people who have been on boards and committees for six years, I think if there are people waiting in the wings who are well qualified, they may be you know, given preference, but if there aren't those people waiting in the wings who are qualified and the people who are in the position now wanna to continue to serve, I think there's an openness to that that there hasn't been in the past. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that. Okay. All right. Um, any other new business not anticipated? I can't think of anything, no. All right. Item, item 10, uh, Form A, a and subdivision applications. Do we have any of those coming? Pam and I are happy to report that we do not have those tonight, no. Okay, how about ZBA applications? Nothing new to report tonight. All right, how about SP, SBR, and SUB? Nothing new to report. Okay. I think I've reported um, things already. All right, item 13, Planning Board Committee and Liaison Reports. We'll start with Jack. PVPC. 
Yeah, uh, we had, you know, an executive uh, committee meeting where I think we approved, it seemed like a lot of e-bike e type, you know, stations <laughs> throughout, uh, you know, Western Mass. That seemed, uh, and then we have a quarterly meeting uh, next week on the 14th, Thursday. But again, um, you know, I'm willing to, to, to stay on on the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission as like an alternate. And I can preserve that, you know, executive, you know, committee seat for Amherst. Uh, but that's something that, that needs to be worked out. You know, if I if I indeed step down from uh, the planning board, I just want to, you know, throw that out there. Um, I can't really say, you know, what value I really bring to Amherst being on the executive committee. But uh, um, I just, you know. I do enjoy, I think they, uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission uh, um, provides a, an important mission, you know, to our region. And I just, I, I'm, I'm, you know, 100% behind what they do. Mm -hmm. So um, just want to say that. So, so I could be an alternate if I'm not on the planning board, but it would have to be, you know, ferreted out. Right. Chris, so. is it, is it, is there some sort of policy that one of the board members is a, a delegate to the PVPC? Usually one of the board members is um, a member of the PVPC, yes. Um, and the board as a whole, you know, designates that member. Right. I think town council has some, some thing to do with that, whether it's just approval of the designation or not, I don't really know. Um, okay. And then there is usually an alternative. And often what has happened in the past is that a planning board member is the actual member of the PVPC and then um, a staff member is, or, or another outside resident is, um, is the alternative. Yeah, for, for, for example, uh, uh, the gentleman in Belchertown, I can't think of his name, uh, the planning director there in Belchertown. Doug Albertson. Uh, yeah, so he's on the executive committee, you know, and obviously, you know, he's more of an alternate sort of thing, but because uh, uh, he's not you know, on the planning board, whatever. And, there, and there's other towns, I think, you know, Springfield, uh, they're, you know, one of their planning um, folks are representative, but they don't really have a planning board, you know, representative. It, it, I, I don't understand why towns don't participate, you know within the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission meetings, it just seems like, it seems like, uh, yeah, it, it confuses me because it's like, why wouldn't you? But there's a lot of towns that don't, you know, participate, uh, but they pay into it, so. Um, All right, well, um, it sounds like once we have our new board members, we can, you know, review what the different board op liaison openings are and find out if, you know, who, who, who wants to be involved with the PVPC. And um, I assume you can keep being involved, uh, you know, without sort of having the Amherst hat on. Uh, well, not, I, I, not, I mean, I would have to be, I would have to be, to keep my position, uh, you know, I would have to be an alternate is all versus okay. I'm the primary now. So okay. I think, and I think Paul, Paul Balkman or, you know, the town council would have to get involved with that. But I mean, Good. yeah. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Andrew, CPAC. No updates. Okay. Tom, DRB. No updates this week. All right, Christine, Chris, uh, CRC. So last time we spoke with CRC, we talked about um, a couple of things. We talked about the com um, comprehensive um, housing policy and the CRC had asked the planning department to look through the comprehensive housing policy and come up with some um, zoning amendments that might uh, further the cause of the housing policy. So um, we made a presentation at the last CRC meeting. I'm trying to remember the date. I think it was March 31st. 
And um, among the things that we talked about were um, for the apartments, um, for the apartments category uh, to um, divide the apartments category into class one and class two. And I think the people who are, are familiar with the past work of the zoning subcommittee will remember those discussions. Um, and the class one might be um, one, you know, between three and 24 units and the class two might be um, 25 units up. Anyway, just to give some flexibility to the um, apartments category. And there would be other things as well, like, uh, and um, we've talked about this in the past, um, breaking off triplexes and quadruplexes from the apartments category and, and creating new categories for them that, so that they could be more easily um, infilled into neighborhoods than you know, the apartment, which sounds very large and very fearsome. So there was that, um, and we talked about a number of other things. Anyway, if anybody's interested, I could send you a list of the things that um, that I presented as possibilities. And what the, what's happening is the CRC has this matrix, and they've put into it all the zoning amendments that we worked on last year, whether they were approved or not approved, and what their status was, and then things that we wanted to work on but didn't get to. And so they have this big matrix and it, eventually they're going to kind of shake it up and decide, okay, what are the things that rise to the top that the CRC and the town council want to move ahead with, say, starting in July? That's what they're looking ahead to because they recognize the fact that we're busy now with solar bylaw, flood mapping and other things. So that's what we talked about. We also um, talked to them about the rental registration program which several of the counselors are very interested in. They're interested in making it more, um, more strict, more robust, uh, that there might be a change in the fee to um, people who are renting their property um, and just making it, um, just strengthen, strengthening it. So Rob Mora is working on that and we had a, a long conversation about that. And the other thing that they, uh, that the CRC wants to work on with us is, um, bringing Article 14 uh, into some level of permanency. So things that are currently permitted via Article 14, which you will remember was the temporary zoning uh, during the COVID crisis, um, that you know things that don't really require a special permit, can we make them permanent? So we're talking to them about that. So those are the things that right now the CRC is focusing on. Um, I think the rental registration project is huge and that's going to take up a significant amount of their time going forward over the next six to 12 months, but we'll see. So. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, so report of the chair. Uh, I don't have any particular report. I do have a couple of one comment and one question. Uh, Chris, the, the question has to do with the uh, the sort of design guidelines study and the RFP that's kind of being prepared. Uh, do you have a sort of update on where that whole process is? Yes, Nate has written an RFP um, for the design standards. We're calling it standards now because we wanna make it um, more of a you know, requirement than a guideline. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken that we're planning to bring that to the planning board on the 20th of April, is that right, Nate? Nate is nodding his head. Okay. So, so you're yeah, next that's, that's correct. Yep. Yeah, you'll see um, the, the current draft of the RFP. Um, so this is a project that, you know, we'll all be working on together and it's really, you know, the town manager who puts out RFPs, but I know that the planning board has been interested in what the contents of this is going to be. And so, um, you know, we're going to show it to you for your comments and suggestions. Okay, thanks. All right. And then this, the comment I was going to make for the board was uh, we do have two members who have decided to leave the board uh, this year. So we are, we're going to need two new members. And uh, 
this is the time of year where if you know people who would be great planning board members, please talk to them and encourage them to put in uh, an application when that opens. And I, I think it's actually available to, to, um, to submit any time. Um, mm -hmm. And so, in fact, uh, I, I think it was today I received a email from Mandy Johanneke from the CRC uh, asking me to put together the comments that the chair usually gives for uh, you know what what we're looking for in candidates. So um, it seems like this year's process is starting. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would encourage everybody to think of all your friends and talk to the people who would be great planning board members. Uh, Maria, I see your hand. Yeah, I, I preemptively asked some people and um, they are gonna put their, their, throw their hat in the ring. And I had asked architects just because it's nice to have some, you know, people from a variety of backgrounds, but I think in particular architects. And so I, I asked a couple of ones. So one definitely is a guess. I think Manny Joe had reached out to me as well and, and asked uh, that was going to reapply and I said no, but that I knew someone in particular in town was going to apply and she said, oh yeah, he already did. So, so hopefully, yeah, you'll, you'll have a really strong board. I mean, we, you already are really strong, but um, hopefully, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to leave you high and dry. I, I had a really good person in mind. So hopefully they'll be a contender. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, Maria and, and Jack. Yeah, I just want to say I, I really enjoy working with everyone on the board and it's I think we do such good work and and uh, you know the year I was chair, you know, it was a rough one. Uh, you know, lots of meetings, <laughs> maybe too many. Uh, but boy, you know, we definitely, you know, pushed the the ball forward uh through that. And you know, so I'm just saying that, you know, because Chris kind of mentioned, you know, I, I'm at six years, but if the, you know, if, if someone doesn't rise, you know, to, to everybody's satisfaction, you know, I, I I could consider, you know, doing more because of of everything. But uh, I am so thankful for Doug taking on the chair. It has made my life, you know, much more tolerable and. Mm -hmm. And again, I, I think this this board is 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 well composed, and uh, y'all done you know pretty good job. So except Andrea who showed up you know late tonight. So but that's all right. Okay. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Jack. Um, you know, obviously we're not the ones that pick the next members. Uh, CRC will, uh, I, and then I guess the council. Um, so Jack, if you want to keep your head in the ring, you probably need to put in an application. You're not going to win on a write-in vote. Okay. So that's really, I'm all just I having, I'm just having, I'm, yeah, I'm just having, oop. yeah, I'm just having a little fun there. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. but, um, it is what it is. Thank you. <laughs> yep. All right. So that was the chair's report. <laughs> And Chris, do you have a report from staff? I don't have a report tonight, no, thank you. Okay, so the time is 9.23. It's an early night for us. We powered through a bunch of things and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Okay, good night and thanks for coming in to sign. Good night. Good night. Great. And we'll see you all in, in two thank weeks. You. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome, good night. Good night. Recording. Stop recording.